Live from iRacing's virtual Daytona International Speedway, we say good evening, Sim Racing fans, and welcome to the season opener of the 2024 Full Throttle Real Sim Racing Cup Series. Well, it is a new dawn and no more than just two weeks removed from a Winter Series Championship closing. We are back with the big cars. The NASCAR Cup cars are back for another season of RSR action. And as always, we're happy that you make your Monday night homes right here with us on Respot TV. With Derek Watson, my name is Evan Pasoko. Our producer downstairs is the great Hugo Louise bringing us to you this evening. And it feels weird because it is a very new look to this Cup Series that has adjusted and changed over the course of the last few years. And typically Derek this time of year we're talking duels and we're talking a clash and a lot of build up to the Daytona 250 but one big piece of driver feedback from the offseason was they wanted RSR to start the week of official racing on the service not end it and therefore we move up a week so now we proceed our cup series counterparts and it means all of that preseason pop and circumstance is gone and we are going right into it tonight with with points race number one of 30 of 2024. Yeah, and you know, Evan, the interesting part about that as we look at this full season schedule here in front of you is that means there's less practice, less, you know, in car, less seat time for these drivers to see what they can do on these tracks. I suspect to see a little bit more of the jitters in our opening races here. But look at this, Daytona, Atlanta, Vegas, Bristol, your first four races. You can't win the title, Evan, in your first four races, but you could certainly put yourself well behind the eight ball with those very four eclectic tracks. And you get a speedway, a super speedway, and a short track in those first four. Um, so it's going to be a good sample size as well. Now, of course, the Cup Series runs 36 weeks. RSR runs 30. So there are some repeat races not notable and are missing from that calendar. That'll happen. But, of course, when you get over to the right-hand side of your screen, the playoffs, including that regular season finale at Darlington and the championship race at Phoenix, that whole string is tit for tat right alongside the Cup Series. And, therefore, all those Cup Series changes come here to RSR as well, right? Darlington being the season finale. The Indian Indianapolis Oval coming back. Iowa making the calendar. And then some RSR specific changes. Sonoma's back. Watkins Glen going to be back as well. So those are some of the changes on this 24 calendar compared to 23. But all in all, it is a relatively familiar looking schedule when you're talking about NASCAR Cup Series racing. Yeah, a lot of the classics are here along with some of the new quirks and tweaks we're going to have to the real life cup series. So this league is a great way for drivers to kind of feel what it's like in a, a 30 week season. Evan, it sounds fun and it is fun, but it is a grind. It's, it's just a grind as if you are a real cup driver. So, yeah, these guys will have a lot of fun across 30 weeks. Well, qualifying is underway, Evan, as we see. Uh, a car here on pit road and i think they're wondering if they want to head out or not but um there is plenty of qualifying happening here's the 77 part of extreme motorsports on the track you see the ticker up there look at that is up here on the pole and just got beat by cody harris the ohio native well, liam sheen jumps to the top as well as these drivers click in those second timed laps unlike what we saw in the winter series the cup series will stay in single car qualified procedure so five minutes two laps to put down your best lap time sheen currently top of the board lariah on board with him as king jumps to p2 dancing heads into the top five let's see what can the sim speed shot 44 and michael lariah do second at pace lap going to be better than all the rest of them he will will not be able to crack into the top five. He stays 14th still at the moment with his best lap time in the high 49s. 
And race spots own Dylan Coyle back again. This time a full cup schedule for him. He'll be our in-race reporter a week in and a week out. We'll see what he can do as the clock starts to run out of time. Less than 30 seconds to go in qualifying. Yeah, he'll make it around here, but this must be his second lap. And you can tell that based upon the line he's taken, Evan. These cup cars, you still want to get that wind-up lap in. You still want to get around there and wind up that engine. So your first lap is still up against the wall. Your second lap down on the yellow line. He'll pass the line here with about 10 seconds to go. And he's going to get a 49.695. That's going to put him 29th on the board. Yeah, a little bit of work to do. I think uh, 34 cars get to start this first race of the season of the 39 that are signed up and eligible to compete. So that means with the field capped at 40, nobody going to be sent home in week number one. So we don't have to talk about constellation points or anything in the first race of the season. But with that, qualifying is done. So for the first time in 2024, let's go trackside and take a look at your real sim race starting grid it is liam sheen on a pole position he will bring us to the green to start the year a 49 514 the best of them all and he will be joined on the front row with some big company in that 29 of kevin king dominic howe and matt danson will make up row number two they start in third and fourth tonight with cody harris p5 and the return of daniel eberhardt p6 Moving back is Ross Cato in P7 with Brandon Gass, one of our new drivers up there in P8. Agnel Phillip had a great winter season. He'll start P9 with Sam Nieto in P10. And then James Ross and Andrew Freenosh, 11 and 12 in row six. It is the head of Extreme Performance Motorsports, Mike Maddox, who's going to be lucky number 13 tonight. He'll be joined by Michael Araya on row number 7. Thomas George starts 15 tonight. Nick Mara in P16. Another newcomer, Cam Peterson, starting 17th. And Madazzi Major, familiar colors for him. He starts 18th. And then Braden Whitaker back in 19th. Grant Davis on the outside in row 10. Maverick Davis and Garrett Pittman, 21st and 22nd. And then Bradley Burke and Tom Morano, 23rd third and 24th. 25th tonight, getting to go to Eric Papadow and DeAndre Kane in his first Cup um, cup Series excursion, we'll say, is P26. Joseph Tice starts 27th, Brett Larson 28th. Then we talked about Dylan DeCoyle. He's got some work to do for the inside of row 15. He'll start 29th with Brandon Westbrook rounding out your top 30. Moving back here into P31. This will be the last of the field. Austin Coop with Chris Trepa on the outside in 32nd. Then Steve Soa and Matthew Mara, 33rd and 33rd and 34th, pardon me. And that is your look top to bottom of the grid, Evan. It is indeed. A lot of familiar faces, some new ones as well. A lot of new looks, though. New teams, new paint schemes, new rules. We'll have plenty of time to talk about that tonight. You look at your Real Sim Racing race information. 100 laps, 250 miles on the docket this afternoon. This is still a fixed setup series. Everybody is running the iRacing default fixed setup. No advantage to anybody. Zero fast repairs available. There are four sets of tires available on pit road, and there is 100 percent fuel capacity in these cars looking forward to an exciting race the end of it all going to be coming well much later on this year when we're talking about a championship race that's not till november the 4th though at phoenix where that cup series title belt is on the line there's a team championship as well we'll talk plenty more about that over the course of these next nine months but for tonight the challenge is pretty simple Derek a race win on the line at Daytona and a win and you're in could really get your 2024 kicked off the right way and listen it's Daytona and it's it's every NASCAR fan's dream when you, if you close your eyes at night and think about it to win at Daytona now you can do it here possibly you're going on the grid one thirty-four shot coming home as a Daytona champion. There's multiple Daytona winners in this field, Evan. Will we see a repeat winner? Will we see a new winner? Who knows how this race will go, but we're about to find out. And as we always say, we're happy that you're spending your Monday night with us here on Race Talk TV. It's car down and in. Let's go racing at Daytona.
already three wide for the race lead. Lot number one goes in favor of Dominic Cow. Dancing was going backwards top side. Then the 29 of Kef King went up there, gave the outside some momentum, and he picks up a few spots. Looks like to get it figured out, it'll be two by two off of turn two. You know, I'm not sure Matt just wants to be there. The way Matt Dancing pulled up that top line, I thought that Matt was trying to fall back in line, and then the top lane sort of moved up and caught him. I'm not positive he wants to be there, but look at this. The top lane right now is dominant. That 29 car, Kevin King, who's leader right here representing the team, and doing a good job at it. There was uh, a fun tweet out. Uh, I think it was Ross Cater or somebody else had put it out. They were real excited when they saw the schedule announcement and they looked at the roster stocking space on there and got a little bit more nervous, right? He is an intimidated competitor that has been at the top level of many of the IRS and ranks over the last couple of years and happy to see him back again on Mondays because he is going to force the rest of this field to elevate their game to his level. These Monday night races have never been out a place of reference huge a place for an easy top five top ten it has been about pushing yourself but challenge is early caution flag and a big accident towards the tail end of the field it's gonna slow things down early on lot number three yeah big yellow here let's wait and see the results of what happened but this is what some drivers fear caution three cautions and a lot of drivers told me they were scared of than what we think at Daytona about the middle line. Typically, it's, you know, the line that falls through. But there was a massive road coming there, and this little bit of contact sent chaos. Well, for some drivers, Evan, right now, race one, lap four. If your Daytona hopes aren't dashed, they're definitely, you know, uh, they're definitely injured, let's say. It seemed like that nobody was really timid off of the get-go. I mean, they went three wide for the race lead pretty early on, and then it was that big run up the middle that kind of spooked some of the cars. Uh, Mara swerved high to avoid it, and I don't know if the 82 went low or if there was some contact, but race leaders down pit road early in this one. Again, this is very much a fuel decision based on the race length in this one uh, and not tires. Yeah, fuel is definitely going to play a factor here in everything you do as far as how this race plays out. If it goes green, those extra couple laps could mean something as far as what strategies you can pull off and who you can work with. Let's so look at the 38 machine uh, leaving pit road of Matt Danson. Also a good look at some of the new body styles that have changed with these cup cars since we last saw them in the championship race last year at Phoenix. It is an all new look to the Toyota Camry on the field. It's also the uh, the dark horse version of Ford's Mustang. So that Chevy of Matt Danson will look the same. Chevy the only manufacturer to not go for a new body style, but I think there's a good look at all three of them in one shot there. Uh, fun to see those coming soon, and I think for 25, Chevy will have to have a new body on the car because uh, the Chevrolet stopped being production of that uh, Camaro, so that'll be fun to see in the future as well as these next-gen cars continue to develop and get kind of their own generations. Uh, I mentioned under this yellow, it'd be a good chance to talk about penalties and how that works. A little bit of RSR penalty 101 for those who may be tuning in with us for the first time. And I'll start that point by mentioning that Nicholas Mara has claimed the caution. What that means is if there's an incident and a driver feels like they were at fault, they can claim responsibility for the yellow. What that will do is it will give them one penalty point and they'll get an end of the longest line of penalties. So Nick has one penalty point now. He gets an EOL. If at any point during the season you get six penalty points, you'll be suspended for a race. That's the limit. Now, if you get seven, 
then you would be suspended for two. How that works is, say Nick didn't claim that yellow, and a post-race review, Derek said that it was his fault, it would be two penalty points. So that is the in-race incentive for these drivers to self-police, self-claim yellows, because if it has to be blamed to them after the race, that penalty is going to be more severe, and it would be joined by a championship points penalty as well. There's that second look. Again, the 40 car swerving high. I think Nick maybe kind of second guessed himself there. Uh, he was certainly where the contact started, but uh, tough decision for him to have to claim that. Yeah, and in that moment, it's hard to figure out what probably happened because as a race car driver, what we see in the car and what happened on the track can be two very, very, very different things here. But now the interesting story, by the way, Evan, is not who pitted the first time for gas, who's pitting the second time for gas. Uh, if anybody, that could also change things as well because Kevin King is on pit road again. Yeah, this is an interesting one, and maybe the decision for Kevin is just as simple as, uh, you know, they went three wide for the race lead early, unlike some of the other leagues you'll see here on the service where you can, you know, get a quick repair and jump back into the race. Those are not options here on Mondays. Maybe the decision for him is, I just want to come down, add a little bit more fuel, drop to the back, and play the fuel conservation game. So he takes himself kind of voluntarily out of those top five, and uh, we'll drop all the way to the tail end of this 34 car field. And what that does is Grant Davis is going to go to the race lead in this one. He was the only driver to not pit at all. The 24 car stays out, takes over the top position. Liam Sheen, Kevin King, some of the top cars off of pit road. They'll therefore cycle into second and third. Now, you'll ask yourself, why won't Grant pit here? That's a question you can ask as if you were as a competitor. The truth is, he probably just believes that, you know, up front he's, you know, safer as far as not finding calamity or, or, or damage or wrecks here on the track. So he just wants to play this card and see how it works. And he'll just pit in what he perceives to be the next yellow. This time, control car going to dictate when we restart. It's Davis on the inside. Green flag back in the air. A little bit discombobulated inside the advantage for now, but the top side gets hooked up. It's a big push. Cato getting shoved, but the 94 car of Vagnal Phillip jumping up now to steal the momentum as the 78 is Sheen, and then the two, and then the 24. So those three lead cars go from the bottom to the top the second they saw the outside line starting to gain some momentum. Yeah, of course, that's shades of real life racing of trying to control the draft and Often such a dangerous move and really a big risk to take, but drivers are going to try to do it here. You know, and when you talk about a driver like the two of Sam Nieto or even Grant Davis, your current leader, these are drivers who just participated in the Winter Series, Evan. As you know, that Winter Series used the Gen 4 cars. That was a driver-led initiative. But the reason I bring it up is because drafting and bump drafting in those cars is very different than what it is in the next gen. As shown there on the bottom of your screen, look at that run there. If they did that in a Gen 4 car, Evan, someone would have been upside down, up in the air, wheels off the ground, and the yellow would have been out. But here they are saying, oh my gosh, look at that pass up top. And they're good. A lot of movement using every little bit of this Daytona International Speedway that they can. And again, it's a big week here at Daytona on the service. The Edascar Coca-Cola iRacing Series starts tomorrow night. The iRacing Daytona 500 this weekend. Oh, of course, official racing all throughout and more trouble from the back again. And that's another big accident with about a half a dozen cars this time in turn two. Yeah, that's going to be a lot of massive damage here. And that's what a lot of drivers told me tonight. That I said, hey, what's the goal for tonight? And they did, a lot of people just said, avoid the wrecks. Stay out of the damage, and let's worry about the race with, like, 10 to go. And that, that looked like a massive wreck in the back of that camera shot there. Evan, I bet there were at least seven, eight cars involved in that. So second yellow flag of the night will slow things down early. Driver discussion already picking up as 
They all debate what did and did not happen from all of their respective uh, opinions. And uh, that is, I think, uh, the, the fun part of us to try to listen in. And there's the contact there. Ooh. It's Tice contact with Kaczynski, I believe. Or no, the I think it might have been DeAndre Kane, actually, um, in the 90 car. It's, it's new paint schemes, new numbers, right? Trying to, trying to get everybody acclimated. It's the same for us up here in the booth. Um, I think a checkup put Kane a little bit high. Tice tried to jump on it, went low, and, and that's where the contact happened. Yeah, that opening that door move is so scary because of that momentum that carries with it. But if you notice in the bottom of that replay there, I think it was Matt dancing. Sort of had a front row seat, Evan. He just, that wreck happened. He just went full throttle and just drove right on by. And uh, so maybe Matt dancing would be the best litigator of that caution because he, I think, saw it live and really in person here. Well, now we're under yellow again. Now I would want to think that Grant Davis now would come down and get gas here. And we'll see what happens. Yep, everyone's pulling down here. At least your top three. That's Brandon Gass, Grant Davis, Sam Nieto, and others here, Evan. As you said, probably still no tires. But now on lap 10, we go green on lap 14-ish. Now you're almost looking, if we stay green, at a two-stop race with a little bit of fuel saving. Yeah, that's why you see these drivers responding and jumping all over it is the half race distance at these super speedways just happens to put these guys just outside of that fuel window that you reference and that's why kind of uncharacteristically for a plate race in which you know fuel and, and tires aren't typically at the forefront drivers came down immediately and then here as well on the second yellow more drivers in for service um only andrew freenosh stays out so we had at least one lone wolf in both of the groups uh, this time, Freenosh decides to not come down pit road, so the 88 car will stay out, cycle through to the race lead. Daniel Eberhardt going to be the first car out, having gotten um, at least onto the pit lane. And I'll preface it by saying that, because I'm going to just double check. I'm not showing any time in the stall registered for Eberhardt. That could always just be my timing and scoring, but uh, it does appear that Everhart just drove through pit road, missed his box. Yep, so he does box. not get any benefit of fuel. First truck or first car with fuel is going to be Liam Sheen. 5.4 seconds in the stall. He'll be third. So last caution, you shared a new RSR rule. So I'm going to take the chance to do one here myself. And it sort of ties into this who took gas, who didn't take gas story. New this season is the halfway point stage break rules now, or stage points, pardon me. There is no break. I'm going to take that word out. Sorry, I used it. <laughs> this is habit. There's no break here, Evan, but there are halfway points paid out on the ovals. There's no break here. We're not going to go yellow. So if you pitted right now, and especially if you came down again, as you're going to see a couple drivers do, if this stays green, you could probably stay out and claim those halfway points and be a smidgen ahead of your competitors who aren't taking gas here. Now, in the road courses, there will be a one-lap yellow. That's a whole new world we'll talk about later in the season. But this new halfway point thing, this could play a factor here. It could be because, to your point, yeah, it's, there is no break. The race will not have a yellow. There will be no pause. But the top 10 at the end of the halfway point, so that is the completion of lap number 50, are going to walk away with bonus points. That's 10 for the race winner, down to 1 for P10. 11th on the back, you get nothing. Um, so that's kind of in line with, you know, some of the strategy we see with NASCAR and the stages. Again, without the yellow, though, on the oval side of things. But that's a huge shakeup and probably the biggest points shakeup in terms of points that can be scored that has ever happened in this full throttle real sim racing cup series because it was always pretty simple derek right max points was 42 it's 40 for the race win 35 for second and it's one point increments from there but if you let a lap and you led the most laps that's two bonus points so the cap was always 42 now with those bonus points available that cap rockets up to 52 yeah and rockets up and that's a big jump even if you're gonna someone who's maybe gonna finish mid-pack tonight Though if you score your halfway point well, you could definitely still put yourself in contention. And those will matter throughout the season. And that could be one reason that Andrew Freenosh maybe said, hey, you know what? Let me get my one bonus point now for leading a lap, by the way. Points matter. Andrew, of course, is a well-seasoned veteran of iRacing. So he'll come out here with this 88 machine and see what he can do with it. But third restart, Evan. 
I don't think it's going to be any more calm than restart one or two. And now we're here on the lap 12 of 100. Well, Joseph Tice, Brandon Westbrook, James Ross are all already out of this race. So that is a decent bit of attrition for the opening. Well, 12 laps down, 88 laps to go this time by. It's Andrew Freenosh's turn at the front. Green flag is back in the air, and it's a decent start for the bottom. Freenosh going to get the first car length and a half. Already some drivers swapping lanes. They have to wait to that start finish to do so. That one looked clean as they get through the gears to turn one. And here they're coming down to turn one. Drivers already starting, as you said, move lanes, find friends, maybe get away from drivers you don't trust here. Maybe someone is opening 12 laps has moved too much here, but there's Freenosh now, now controlling the top lane and going to lead to that top lane down the back straight. So why do you want to do that is what people will ask him. And why do you want to move back and forth? Well, you sort of want to kill the run. You sort of want to kill the run that's coming and also at the same time take advantage of it. Otherwise that drowning lane can pass right by you if you let it. So you'll see Andrew kind of move back and forth. In the moment, he'll move down probably because that bottom is now getting a run. There's a lot of good pushers down there. In the battle, probably by turn one, they should be almost neck and neck here, I believe. See a little bit of uh, disconnect on the push there. There's kind of four big opportunities, three big opportunities to push here. The, the super stretch down the back. And then both of those kind of front straight shoots uh, off of four to the trial. But that trial is essentially a turn in of itself. You don't want to push somebody because you can get a car up soon if you do so. And then it's that second shoot off of the trial down to turn one. Nieto, the 44 car, Loria going to go low with them. So two cars bail on the top side, go to the bottom. And it'll break this battle for the race lead, nose to nose. But once more, Everhart pushing Freenosh got the edge at the stripe. And this has been a duo. The Freenosh and Everhart battles go back many years on these RSR Monday nights. And a bit of a throwback seeing those two cars running one two here at Daytona. Yeah, great battle always to see. Of course, you know, Everhart up here in the second car on the top lane known to be a great daytona racer one of you special events here and there at this track so great job by him but now the story i think to see the fun to look at as well evan here to get that group in the back he's decided this is too spicy for them they don't want to be here they're going to hang out and see what happens so we'll keep an eye on that later in the race but you can see it in the back of that camera shot a little bit as these drivers are too wide here and moving around a lot that's what stuck out to me so far. You know, a lot of times in iRacing, Evan, the most common line heard on iRacing during a super speedway is hold your line. Everyone says it. It's not that easy to do. And these guys are proving it. Look how much they wiggle back and forth. That makes bump drafting that much harder. It is funny because this type of racing at a, a super speedway is both the most accessible form of racing in terms of this is the kind of race that anybody could win but it is also maybe the most difficult to nail 100 percent. that's why you will see drivers be better at plate racing than others right you there's some names that come to mind the denny hamlins the brad kozlowski's of the world and the cup side of things are just that good but you could also get anybody to win it right underfunded equipment new drivers so it is an interesting dynamic between you know it's it's probably the most accessible form of racing but there is still skill and there is still strategy there is still the the drafting you're holding your car straight the teamwork uh, that can better your chances. Nothing's going to just win you at 110% on speed, especially in a fixed setup series like this. Um, but just worth noting that there's a fun balance of both. The outside's got the benefit now. You're looking at this lead pack that is about 25 cars strong, 26 maybe. Let's toss Steve So into the mix as well. And from there on back, you've got some stragglers, still about 30 or 31 cars on track after those first couple of incidents. But things, I'm not going to say calm, but calmer than what we've seen. They are sticking pretty much to that two by two. Yeah, and you know what? What I noticed here is Everhart and Freenosh must be getting along well and both be happy with one another. Because look at that gap there. That's a great shot. Either one of them could easily dip down the bottom and leave the bottom lane and, you know, dump the other one, so to speak. That's a term we use in super speedway racing all the time. 
but they're stuck together, literally now stuck together, and they must be happy with how each other is driving, Evan, because they are just connected together, and they must love that top lane because they've not moved from it. Nieto, though, is leading that bottom lane, and if he gets the Ryan on his back bumper, he could make a run of this pretty easily. The other question is, you have to weigh the is it worth it factor, right? I think that's the first thing that comes to mind when we had both of those incidents in the opening 10 laps is if you want to be aggressive enough and make it happen, right? Chris trepa has been pretty calm, I would say, all things considered tonight, but he started this race in 32nd position. He was P5 at the strike the last time by. That's just changing lanes. You're not necessarily being the instigator in the three wide, but taking advantage of the opportunities. So if you want to make moves, you most certainly can. But again, you ask yourself, is it worth it? That's the question that all of those drivers have to balance. And talking about big movers, an unfortunate update, Derek, that the night has come to an end for Kevin King. That car to the garage, his Daytona 250 ends before it really got started. Well, that's disappointing for Kevin King, but in a small way, Evan, maybe the sigh of relief for other people in the field. As you said, Kevin is a great racer and you know, an intimidating figure in some ways within the simulator. So maybe some are breathing a sigh of relief here, but now look at this. Man, I thought I thought for the first time Everhart kind of got offline with Freenosh and maybe was thinking about, you know, dipping down. But this bottom lane's starting to move. And the thing about it right now is if you move too late, if you are Eberhart, you will stick yourself in that sucker hole. But our first piece of lap traffic is coming up, Evan. It's time to hold your breath and grip onto something. And let's see if we make it through here. And the driver comes over the radio, says that I'm going to hold the wall. So it's going to put us three wide, exit of the tri-oval, bit of a tricky spot. And then into turn one, going to be Whoa. tricky because those cars are going to want to wash high. And Watson doing everything he can to stay up and out of the way. And it looks like, for the most part, they're going to be able to make it through incident free. A little bit of clenching happened into turn one, but it happens. And in the end, that top side, big winners. They got six, seven car lengths out in front just as quickly, though. More drivers up top want to go bottom. Danson drops to the inside. He's going to bring Dylan to coil with him. I don't think they've got the strength and numbers to get up next to Freenosh, but goes to show that drivers are not afraid of going to the bottom to try to continue their forward progress. Matt Danson, by the way, Evan, so impressed as he's going to get cut off there and going to get a car in front of him now. But Matt Danson, by the way, so impressed. A member of RSR who's from Australia. It is, uh, I think, 12.45 p.m. tomorrow in Australia right now, Evan. So he is uh, committed to what he's doing here. Part of that Altus Esports team now has a car of the 78 in front of him. That, I believe, is Liam Sheen, who is no, uh, you know, no rookie here at Daytona. Matt always has to get up early for these. Uh, once upon a time, I was I was in Melbourne, actually, fresh off of a 16-hour flight and had to do some production work for a Coke Series race at Matt's house. And it's weird doing any sort of iRacing stuff in the wee hours of the morning, but Matt's been quite committed to that and uh, has quickly become one of the stalwarts and one of the staple members of these RSR races on Monday nights. Has uh, had a lot of success as well, which is worth noting. Um, you know, has walked away uh, with a couple of of uh, you know championships as well 2021 winter series champion for matt danson still looking though for the cup series title belt it was a four peat for freenosh agno phillips working on his own dynasty he's won the last two promise you danson would love to spoil that here in 2024 yeah so right now as you said an important reason to race hard tonight win and in win and you're in the playoffs or most likely in the playoffs there's a couple there's a couple qualifiers to that comment but that's the general rule is win and in i am stunned by how much this top lane is working and i don't think it's working better than the bottom evan as much as the drivers up top are just more committed look at that lane changes behind there will kill a line it will kill that drafting line so i don't think that the top lane is working quote unquote better just that the drivers up there are, are committed and stuck to it as for the bottom line keeps moving around. And you talk about some of the newer rules. Drivers may be using this small opportunity of relative calm for Daytona standards to ask some questions because 
to your point, talking about the fuel and maybe how does that play into that lap 50 marker, right? The end of lap 50 paying points to the drivers in the top 10. Well, drivers just asking race control just to clarify. So the gears are turning. We're only 24 laps down, so we're still 26 away from halfway. But those bonus points already at front of mind. That's going to be a story all season long, I suspect. Well, I can tell you that I would suspect that your top two of Freenosh and Eberhardt are not worried about those points because I can't see a way while leading this race, at least, that they're going to make it back around to lap 50 without having taken gas under your last yellow. So the, the, the conversation really starts probably third on back as far as thinking if you can make it, if you cannot make it. Probably a little bit of lifting here in a draft would be required to make it and uh, you know staying in the draft at the same time here. But once again, again, Andrew Frenosh is still leading this pack, Evan. He has got to be well on his way to starting to lock up that most laps lead point here this evening. He is doing a good job of putting a dent in it so far. He has led 14 laps so far this afternoon. You can see that lead pack has splintered off some drivers at the back. Uh, that would be Papanow, Matt Mara, Tom Marano, Manazzi Major. That's uh, almost uh, the Mara Motorsports Group and then company have uh, formed up about three seconds off of the race lead. I think they're in a pretty comfortable spot. They want to be close enough to this lead pack, but far enough away that if they want them up, they've got some time to avoid it. And Eberhardt, Freenosh, I don't know if they've been racing with each other outside of these Mondays, but at least in RSR context, it's been a while since they've been bump drafted, but they've been plenty aggressive. Those are two of the very best drivers you'll find anywhere. Eberhardt, a late registrant, just got his sign up completed today to jump in. Again, starting a week early. A lot of drivers rushing to get paint schemes finished and numbers assigned sponsors locked in uh, but happy to see uh, again 39 cars registered 34 making a start in this Daytona opener and very clearly now in the longest green flag run we've seen so far tonight as Daniel Eberhard I was going to say maybe leaving Freenosh they've been pretty loyal to one another it was just a bit of a fake he goes right back up in line it makes me wonder if there was some mixed communication there between the two because with how stuck Eberhardt has been unless I don't know, unless he's running hot, but he's not really been pushing enough to be running hot. That's probably the one story we've not touched on here with the bump drafting is you can't overheat these motors, but in a fixed setup, Evan, provided by Iris, and to overheat that motor, you really do need to be like nose to tail for a couple of laps straight, as we see as a movement in the back there. Um, maybe he was just giving some air to the car. I'm not sure. Nick Mara a little bit frustrated on the radio. I referenced, um, you know, that, that pack that was kind of trailing off of the leaders. They can't really get coordinated with each other. You see the lead pack two by two, and then that's them on the very right side. They are losing time to these leaders. That pack of four falling away because they can't figure out the draft with one another. Uh, as Brandon Gass comes down pit road, it'll be a solo trip to pit road for the 20 car. Not something you normally want to be doing in a race like this. No, not at all. That's uh, confusing to me that he's going to do that by himself. That makes me think that there's something going on that he needs to address, whether it be a technical gremlin, whether it be, uh, I don't know. But, yeah, that's surprising to me unless he's playing some big game that I can't think about. Because if, even if you could make a, a two-stopper from here or, let's see, I'm going to 40. But yeah, you have to stop again. I, you, drafting by yourself or running by yourself without the draft is going to be so much slower than these guys that I don't see how it works out and he is having an extended stay in the box so there is some sort of an issue for Brandon to gas that may take him out of this race early again almost at a third of the way through and again lead change is going to be constant Freenosh has led the most out of anybody at 18 we've also seen Nieta lead a lap Dominic Howe Grant Davis led three Brandon Gass led three in his own right so did Kevin King but those last two names seemingly out of this race already and even though it's no longer the winter series Derek these drivers have shed all of those kind of holiday and snow themed paint schemes Every time we come to Daytona, that leaderboard on the left-hand side of your screen is lit up like a Christmas tree. Green means they made a move forward. Red means they dropped back a spot, and it is going to be like that all afternoon long. And as a viewer, that's why we love Daytona, right? Because it's not one driver running away 
with a race, and those are fun to see in their own right. But here, you never know who leads a lap. Everyone could end up leading a lap. You know, you never know lap by lap, and it's not just the leader. Look at the red and green all the way up and down that pylon. It's just moving back and forth and back and forth. And now on the bottom of your screen, that's that draft pack you've been talking about. The guys who wanted to sit back and. I don't think this is much about fuel saving Evan as much as they just wanted to be out of the wreck. There's a belief among some drivers that listen, I'm going to start the, or ride to the back, and then when the wreck happens, I can kind of meander my way by and you know make it up later. But that's what this pack appears to be doing is just sort of waiting for something to happen. The downside of the strategy, Evan, is if nothing ever happens, it feels like you're about 10 miles from the pack. It really does, and this, I think, could be worse because that secondary pack was once two packs. It was a group of three and a group of about four. And I mentioned that, you know, Mara wasn't too happy with some of the drafting. Um, the downside is the first trailing pack was doing such a bad job, they fell back to the second. The good news is, well, that makes them one larger pack. More cars means you're more likely to be able to get in line single file and start knocking out lap times because you need to catch those leaders. You're 4.3 seconds back right now. If you continue to lose time, you're going to get to the point where you are out of touch. You will fall too far back. And just for context, Liam Sheen just led his first lap of the night. His lap time, a 47-2-1-1. It was a 46.994 for Mike Maddox leading that trailing pack. So now that they've gotten a bigger number of cars assembled, they're doing a bit of a better job of catching the group we're looking at right now, the race leaders who are still side by side. Yeah, we'll see how they follow that and see how they do as the night goes on. But now here is an Altus Esports car. Evan, we've been seeing one of these for about three or four months in a row now, but a different one. We saw Seth, the Merchant Ready Control, the Icebreaker Series. But now, here's Matt Danson, and he's looking to lead his first lap here. This will be the completion of lap 33 if he does it. And we'll see Liam Sheen coming to the outside, but I believe Danson will get his first lap led. Man, that Altus Esports team, Evan, it just seems like no matter who you plug into that team, no matter who you plug into a car, first off, the paint schemes are iconic. They're the easiest ones to spot, in my opinion, across most of Esports, but... That whole roster is just stacked full of talent. It really is, and, and that team championship is the second bit of this 2024 season that we'll talk about. Uh, there are many teams that have more than four cars, four is the cap, so like Extreme Performance Motorsports, they're going to have to divide themselves after round one into two teams, essentially, because well, you can't have an eight-car team fighting against a three-car team. The great denominator, though, is that the equalizer being only three cars from each team can score points any given night. So a three-car team could still go head-to-head -head with a five-car team, for example. It is just going to be a little bit more tricky in terms of matching them points-wise. But that points battle uh, has been fun to watch. In seasons past, you look back to the 2023 Cup Series. Um, that one came down to uh, a pretty close one. The A51 Pro X Altus Alliance ended up coming home with the team championship. And then even a more recent Recently, in the winter series for 2024, that one was a last race change in which A51 Pro beat Flatout Esports by one single point. So the team championship can at times be just as exciting. Oh, it can be very exciting, right? And the, the single points matter all the time. We talk about it, but now look at this in a reversal roll about what 20 laps ago. Now the bottom lane is moving. Now you got. Uh, Matt dancing up there. You got Dylan Coyles, race spots. Oh, look at that up in P2, pushing around here. And this is sort of that equal edge you talked about, Evan, and that's sort of that appeal to the race is that anyone can win. Someone like Doyle had a very rough icebreaker series, and all of a sudden right now he has P2 up in the Cup Series here at Daytona. And running, you know, right up against a, a winner series champion and one of the top drivers on the oval side of things that Matt Danson, who's been through, uh, you know, the, the road to pro ladder with Altus and, uh, you know, a, a teammate to some of the other top drivers we've seen as we've got some cars headed to pit road. They are splintering off and it, it is going to be a group of four that comes down pit road. The two machine is in. That's Nieto, Davis, Loria, Burke. They are all down pit road. And Matt Danson says over the radio, that's all I needed was a lap lead. The 38 car is going to take his bonus point. That is it. And that will hand the race lead off to the aforementioned number 79 of Dylan Coyle. 
Yeah, Matt Denson decided he doesn't want to be up there in the middle of it. He'll wait till later to make that move again. He's done his little bit of experimenting, Evan. Now he knows what the car can do. He knows how to carve through a field. He knows who he can pass and how he can pass them, who we can trust, who we can't trust. But right now, Dylan Quill side by side with Daytona veteran Daniel Everhart here. Let's see who leads this lap. It's gonna be Everhart, I believe. So Everhart will get that point. I think that's his first lap led. It is going to be lap led number one, or number two, I should say, sorry, for Daniel Eberhardt. Uh, so he has gotten one earlier, nowhere near Freenosh's total of 20. Uh, but Dylan Coyle also credited with the lap led. Danson actually dropped back behind him before they got to the start-finish line the last time by. So it is bonus points aplenty for all of those drivers running inside of the top five. And really, for the first time in a little while, the bottom... Maybe the better place to be for now. Eberhardt, remember, was pushing Freenosh for the longest time. Well, they've had a role reversal this time. It's Freenosh lined up behind the E09 car. You know, and that whole pushing topic as well is very interesting. I had talked to some of the drivers tonight before the race, Evan, about pushing or being pushed. And that's a very, honestly, a very controversial topic about would you prefer to be pushed or be the one pushing? Some drivers don't trust others. So they want to push, they think they're a better pusher, or maybe they're happy being pushed because they don't think they can line the car up correctly. So there's a little bit of both across the community about who they trust. And you know, the, the most interesting spots I got actually was from Daniel Upperhart. I said, hey, Daniel, do you prefer to push or be pushed? And he simply said, it depends. What lap is it? I was like, mid-race, he's like, oh yeah, I'll push you mid-race, dot, dot, dot. And he never finished that quote. That is, uh, that sounds like Daniel, right? I mean, I, I think I referenced it uh, talking with you earlier pre-race. Uh, Daniel is one of the most talented drivers out there that you'll find anywhere and has at times been a bit of a controversial topic. A Kyle Busch-esque has gotten himself into some trouble, has had admitted so, and then has gone back out, won races, and done it all over again. That is the Daniel Eberhard MO, but nobody can discredit the driver of the 09 machine is one of the best out there anytime he's on track and having a bit of fun as he serpentines down the back straightaway, pulling back up alongside Coil. This time by 40 down, 60 laps to go. Bigger story, though, is that's going to be 10 to go to halfway. So this lead pack is 14 car strong. Again, some drivers have dropped out to pit. So will we see the rest of these lead cars? Can they get to that halfway point? Or are they going to have to pit before then? Because those bonus points can be very valuable. They can be valuable. And as we said right now, the two leading the race, Everhart and Freenosh, are the two that I'm most confident have to pit before then. But the thing that happened right there on your screen, Evan, that really caught my attention was how slow of a lane change Everhart and Freenosh just made in front of Dylan Coyle. Typically, the success at Daytona or a super speedway comes from your instant decision making. It's sort of the snap lane changes, so you don't cut off your own momentum or don't put yourself in a risk of being turned by someone. I was really taken aback by how long it took both of them to get down in front of Dylan Coyle. And in fact, you saw Kill Coyle even have to kind of lift a little bit and let them in because of how long they were taking it. That's very uncharacteristic, in my opinion, of those two. And Dylan Coyle over the radio asking, uh, was was that a bump draft through the trioval? Uh, remember, I referenced that that's not really a place you want to push. Um, you want to use the shoots from four to the trioval, out of the trioval, the one, but not normally in it. Dylan Coyle see a bit of that aggression as we get to lot number 42 and continue on. Again, this lead pack is uh, 14 cars deep. There's a secondary pack. Remember that other group? They were, what, four and a half seconds back when we were last talking about them. Look at that. That green 40 and Nicholas Mara leading the charge. They have done it. They kind of put their differences aside, got coordinated, and they have caught this lead pack. Now they need to decide, do they want to take the momentum or just kind of stay in line? Morrow will just lift and blend in to the tail end. And now we're talking about a lead pack 20-something car strong. So that makes me think one of two things has happened here, Dylan. Either A, that back line really, really got lined up and got working together pretty well. Or B, this front pack has started to lift a little bit and fuel save because they're thinking about the halfway points and they want to get there. 
and maybe that has allowed Mara and the others to, to close that gap a little bit. Or C, maybe a little bit of both happened right there. But I'm impressed that Mara and that group that had Cody Harris and others in it, I believe, is out here and got all caught up. Now it's a big pack again. Now the intensity will pick up here on the last seven or eight laps before halfway. And I would think it would be a sprint except for that fuel strategy question that lingers over all of this. They'd have to go about 41 laps, 40 laps or so on fuel to be able to get there to the halfway point if they so decide to. Uh, remember, the cars who have pitted are very much in the minority. Most cars haven't pitted. Of course, Everhart and Freenosh dove down the pit lane that last time by as well. So they bow out of the race lead group. So is it the fact that everybody's going to need a pit and they don't want to pit in a huge pack? Or is it they're accepting that maybe pitting now is going to give up the opportunity for the midway bonus points. However, it could benefit them in the long run in terms of fighting for the win. That is that whole added element of strategy that we have not had before. Oh, and there's trouble, though. Oh, Tony no. Harris outside, three wide. It is no yellow. We stay green, but he got squished by the 10 car, and that was almost bad. And a poor night for Cody Harris, who's not used to being a lapped car this early at all, to be fair just got some additional damage and that's going to be tough for him and that's why we talked about whenever that free wide of the lap car happens that's why you start to clench your wheel harder you bite your lip you get nervous because it's harder than you think to be a lapped car and hold a line and let everyone buy the speed they're going it's it's, it's not maybe a, a quarter of an inch of movement is the difference between contact and no contact let's watch it here here's cody harris up top and I don't, that camera shot's hard to tell because the wall got in the way, but it almost looked like maybe someone came up into him versus him coming down. Let's see if we can see it again here. I don't know. That's hard to tell. Yeah, it looks like a bit of, you know, he, he probably here had some more, and this would be the angle. I, yeah, it's, it's hard for him to get any higher, but I think that's more so the spot, the spot on the racetrack, right? I think I referenced this earlier the first time you went three wide with some traffic is you really don't want to find that car on the entry to one because that car's going to push up the hill. And as that car in the middle, you've got to try to give it a little bit more wheel to stay low, but not go too aggressive to come down on the car below you. And I think that might have been the 10 about to push up just a little bit. But it was enough for the contact to be there, but that's such a tricky spot to find yourself inserted into the three wide. It very is a difficult and tricky. However, I want to give credit to the field there. That could have been horrible, right? Credits to everyone, Cody Harris and everyone else involved in getting that gathered up and not making it way worse than what it was. That could have been another 10, 15 car wreck had they not cleaned it up here. So we'll stay green as we are. And now we're seeing a challenge on the bottom here. And they're going to almost be side by side up through the front of the field here. And maybe we'll see another first time leader as we come around. We will see to the stripe. Braden Whitaker's got the advantage and it is going to be lap led number one for the 48 Toyota on the inside. So that takes the number of cars who has led a lap so far tonight in this race into the double digits. I think it's at about 12 or 13. So many drivers are getting their share of some points, but now we're squarely in the battle for bonus points. 10 points up for grabs to the leader at the end of lap number 50. This time by two laps to go to halfway. Dominic Howe surges to the race lead with the push from Thomas George. So now as we come around here this time and next time, we'll see who planned well and who didn't. Everyone stays out this time, at least in this front pack here. So everyone has the gas for this lap here. This will start. 49 so remember they need to get through the start of 50 and then the end of 50 and that's when bonus points are paid out here so great job by way of our dominant cow up here at the front and doing an amazing job leading a field here you know part of the flood of rsr evan if you're a driver is who you kind of get to contest your skills against every week look at this scoring pylon you have you know college series winners you have coke drivers you have everyday driver you can find on the track it, it's a beautiful blend of talent that you get to race with here and we always say the homegrown talent we've seen so many drivers kind of make their mark learn and become top drivers here on these mondays 
and then you can go head to head with some of the already established guys. One lap to go to halfway home. That time at the stripe, the advantage was Brayden Whitaker on the bottom. The lead pack is 18 cars deep, but only 10 of them going to get bonus points in about a mile and a half from this point. So we'll see who gets a little bit more aggressive and who thinks they need those points here. So movement already back and forth across the lines and drivers now going to be contemplating what move works here and make sure they're in the top 10. And we'll see as they come down here through the corner. Everything's pretty calm, but oh, look at that drifting up there. That was 70 of Liam Sheen. He just, no, he was trying to move up and then his tractor sort of caught him by surprise. And the outside's going to have the speed coming to the halfway point. Race leader Dominic Howe gets the first 10 and is your points leader in the first race of the season. And Thomas George was giving him that extra push to the stripe because he said, I want the extra point. He wanted the nose in front of Whitaker to get nine instead of eight. And immediately now that the points have been paid, they are lighting them up on the radio, pitting this time. If you're up top and you want to pit, you need to find a spot in line soon because I expect a slew of cars to come in. Yeah, that's what I think Thomas George just did there, by the way. He pushed Hal way ahead so that he could get down here in front of the pack. Now you'll start to negotiate who's pitting, when they're pitting, and look at everybody. It is tricky to get them down to speed. It looked pretty clean, all things considered. It's Sheen, George, Whitaker, Patterson, Mara, Coyle, Papadow, Morano, Larson, Trepa, and more down pit road. You look at the top seven drivers who stay out. They are almost the only cars who have yet to come down pit road. Almost certainly will come down pit road the next time through. They're capping out at about 41. If they pit this time, it'll be a 42 lap run, Derek. Problem is... Pit stops happening at 48 laps to go, I think would still put them outside of a one-stop window. It's definitely going to be a challenge, right? It's probably going to require one more yellow to help him out here. But there's Dominic Cow, Ross Cato, and Agnel Phillip still running here and trying to make something happen. I think they're almost begging for the yellow to come out. By the way, how have we gone almost half a broadcast? And really, this is the first time we're getting a look at Agnel Phillip. He's had a very quiet race so far to sort of blend it in and waiting to make something happen. He is the two times over defending Cup Series champion. He's got a Winter Series championship to his name as well, but it's just been a little bit quiet tonight. Of course, you can see it's a new look on that number 94 machine. Still sporting the ProPublica Guild as always, but some new colors, nice blue and white Chevy. For this season, Dominic Howe very candidly over the radio says, I've got two laps left. If he can get two more, Ross Cato says, I've got three. I mean, they are so close. If you can get two laps more, you're going 45 laps and you're going to pit at 45 to go. That's the number they need to hit. But that's deceptive, Garrick, Derek, because some of those laps that they ran when they fueled up were under yellow, right? They were saving a little bit of fuel there. So if they get two, if they can push to three, they're going to be just on the edge. But if they're that close again, I don't see any way that any of the cars who have already pitted to this point have any hope of going to the end if this thing stays green. Yeah, I'm not sure anyone does. You're right. This number is deceptive in the sense that some of them are under yellow. Some of them, they were back in the draft, maybe seven, eight cars deep and able to kind of lift and save. You know, it, there's a lot of scenarios going on here. But right now, what you see here is we're now working lap 54. These guys are still moving around here. And now you're seeing other drivers start to blend in here and start to kind of be the slower cars for the moment. So we'll see how that plays out. The leaders are going to catch a car here. And he's just going to go low and let them stay high. Agatha Phillip doing a little bit of live bartering. He says, I'll go an extra lap if, if you want to. So he's trying to find somebody to give himself that little bit of insurance. The other thing is, as these cars try to save and have less car numbers, that big group that pitted Derek has already gone out, gotten fuel, and are at speed. They will certainly have the benefit if everybody else also can't make it on fuel. What's the decision? It's going to be four or five breaking away to pit. It's a clean entry as how Cato, Phillip, and Soa come down pit road. Davis, also a lapped car, is in with them. And what that will then do is cycle things off and 
give the race lead over now once this is completely put a bow on it to two of Sam Nieto. Will Nieto cycle through to the point or can they get ahead of him as they try to blend out on the racetrack? Again, Nieto's been out there. He has been drafted for 20 laps. And as these cars are only leaving the stall now, two car goes to the race lead. There's a two pointer in this, Derek. One is those cars who just pitted on the top of your screen. They are trying to do it on a one stop, right? So they have been saving fuel and they have pushed it to the limit. The cars who pitted early, the cars on the bottom, they know that they were never going to make it on a one stop. So they took less fuel the last time they were down pit road. They only spent about 11 seconds in the box compared to the 15 seconds oh. the most recent group did. So that is also time savings. Yeah, there's a lot of different stories and strategies going on, a lot of decision making going on. And, you know, as a driver, sometimes the benefit is helping having someone with you to help you make those calls whether it be a crew chief or a spotter sometimes as a driver all that info can be overwhelming it can be sort of analysis paralysis if you're trying to consume all of it by yourself so a number of drivers here in rsr the last i looked about maybe eight of them have a spotter or a crew chief there tonight to help them make those decisions as a driver evan i i love that decisions but i just want to let someone else make it this way i can never be wrong it is uh, the name of the game, and it's why I enjoy not having to be the driver or the you know crew chief, whoever's making the decisions in charge of some of the strategy calls because, uh, you know, we have the benefit of armchair quarterback and in at the end, but these drivers have got to make their bed and lay in it. And I think the fun part is, you know, sometimes we'll see a pitch strategy in which 10 cars decide to make one call and 30 cars make the other. Well, in that case, typically the, the odds are in favor of the bigger group right if 40 people did the math and 30 came to one answer probably the better answer um there's a bunch of different strategies and then kind of micro strategies in terms of how early do you want to pit how much you're saving who do you want to run with um so this is a very well uh, versed and well uh, you know strategized decision from across the field what it's going to do is it's going to make this middle portion of the race a little bit weird right because things are so broken up this lead group of four is nine seconds ahead of Liam Sheen and company, that group who pitted most recently. Uh, they only have four cars, though. So that second group, in theory, more pushers, more speed, could have the chance to chip away at that lead as this run goes on. But they are, are the group who needs to catch up while also saving fuel, right? Saving's the most important thing. Um, so I would rather not catch the top four and have fuel then catch them and run out because those top four can't make it. We already know that. So the flip side of the argument, what some drivers across iRacing will believe, Evan, is a group of four to five is the ideal number because you trust you're at four or five like it's in the top of your screen. They're going to stay in line. You know, there's no big runs here. There's, there's, there's no big run that's going to cause a checkup later. No one's drifting out of line. No one's going to try to pass each other. There's no ego here. And so some people will believe that that group of four or five up top maybe not faster quote unquote but more effective because the more cards you get in the line eventually you will create a checkup at some point where someone has to you know move out of lane for air or maybe hits you know just has to check up for something so that they will probably catch this group of four or five but there are plenty of drivers who'd be happier in the group of four or five than trying to kind of wrestle your way in that second group and some more driver radio communication that we can listen in on is that there are two secondary groups, right? There is the group from fifth on the back. That's Liam Sheen, Thomas George, Andrew Freenosh, Daniel Eberhardt, Chris Trappa, and Dylan Coyle. They're the lead group of that second bit of cars. Then another three seconds behind them is the group led by Agno Phillip. It's Agno Phillip, Ross Cato, Dominic Cow, Braden Whitaker, Nick Amara, Eric Papineau. That second group who's trying to make the one-stop strategy on the green flag run I've been openly talking on the radio saying they don't think they can catch that next group up. So they have come to the decision that they need to try to save fuel. So not only do you have a group of cars there trying to save fuel to outlast everybody else, but they're trying to save more fuel than other cars on the same strategy as them. Yeah, you know, I was thinking in my head as you as you're talking about this, and I, you know, both of us can hear the same communications, but obviously. Maybe sometimes at Daytona, your teammate isn't your teammate. It's just whoever you are near at that moment, right? It's just sort of whatever happens. But one of the things I always kind of just really groan about in iRacing, 
these drivers have all these private radios available to them. In iRacing, you can make a private radio on the spot anytime you want to. And these guys insist on broadcasting their strategy. It, it is it, it is my old man moment in iRacing, Evan. I, I, it's, it's my one grump is Knowing I would never... Clouds. I would, <laughs> I would never discuss my fuel strategy out loud. I don't know why they do it. Make a private radio for Pete's sake. Well, I'm not going to complain because, day. yeah, right. Well, listen, if if they all went to these top secret channels, and there are some drivers who are, um, you know, in channels on the RSR Discord, they have private radio channels available to them. Of course, you can create them in the sim. But if they were all talking in private, where would the fun be? I wouldn't know what they're thinking strategy-wise, and I wouldn't get to know when they're mad at each other. So I, for one, would not complain about the all-teams channel. No, as, as a driver or as a broadcaster, part of me, it's great to have that available to us, and I, I agree with you. But as a driver who's trying to work a strategy out, if I had a teammate next to me, we would never discuss this out loud. Why would I tell you my flaws and my weakness in a race I, I don't understand here? But man, this group of four, this group of four, and this is Nieto Davis, uh, Bradley Burke, by the way, he we've not mentioned all night long. And then Michael Laria, who had a great run in the Icebreaker series. Still really strong here. Look at how smooth this line is, Evan. Not a lot of movement, not a lot of swinging out in the corners. You know, no aggressive bumping here. And, yeah, that group is catching up behind them, but not at an exceptional rate by any means. They're doing pretty well here. Yeah, the gap is closing. It was about nine seconds, lead a pack to second a pack. And in, in terms of that gap, it's down to 6.3. So Liam Sheen saying, um, you know, whatever you're doing, it's good. Keep doing it. Um, but the discussion actively between Sheen, George, Freenosh, Trepa in that secondary group is they're already planning splash. Now, I would stand up and applaud Derek if this is all a big ruse to convince us to convince the other drivers that they are not a threat and they and they really could make it that would be a 10 out of 10 poker face moment um, I have not seen a move like that pulled off right normally drivers are honest to a fault on that open channel uh, but that second group even though they're catching is saying that they're likely not going to be able to make it on fuel. That's important because, remember, the point I made is I would rather not catch you and have fuel to the end of the race than catch you and not. Well, if you've accepted, if you're this group and you've accepted that we do not have the fuel to go to the end of the race, which I think is correct, then you need to catch the cars in front of you because you're going to fight them for a position, right? If they thought they could make it on fuel, they probably would not try to catch them and they would focus on fuel saving. And that's why you have this group of cars who's going to try to catch the Nieto group and fight for the win with a pit stop. And that's why the Ross Cato group, who is now 15 seconds behind the leaders, is not trying to catch because their sole focus is not catching them, but saving fuel and outlasting them. Yeah, a couple of different mindsets happening there, right? And you're right. If you're going to have to pit anyways, burn all the fuel and, you know, see what you can make happen in the process. Maybe a yellow comes out or maybe it doesn't. Who knows? We've been green for a very long time here. And as that group catches, if they do, if they ever get connected back together, then the odds of that yellow happening, you know, will just sort of go up in massive amounts of multipliers of odds been happening here. But look at this here, man, this 88 here. This is a moment that's just a little scary to me. When he bump drafts the six and he's get up on his bumper, when you start moving left and right like that, you're going to sweep that car and possibly turn it around. you got to hold still if you want to shove someone like that. That's getting a little nerve-wracking for me to watch that happen here. But we'll see it again. By the way, you talked about the topic of drafting earlier, and you said the three keys of doing it is the front straight, you know, both parts out except for the tribal and the back straight. That hot topic amongst drivers, by the way, is do you want push in the corner? There are some who love it and some who hate it. I, I, I'm team hate it. I, I hate bump drafting in the corners, but if it works, it works, I guess. Yeah, I would agree. Uh, no, thank you. Please stay away from my back bumper, particularly the left rear quarter panel. Please stay well away from that um, when I'm going through the corner. But again, there will become a point in the race where you, out of necessity, have to start pushing in the corner. Maybe it's better to be doing it all night long and to be maybe not comfortable with it, but familiar with it, right? Maybe that's better to start that way. And that way, when you have to do it, when the battle for the race leads on the line, 
it isn't so foreign. Maybe that's part of the thinking. But again, I not being a good super speedway driver compared to these drivers just to start, right? I'll be completely candid about that, but not a fan of the pushing in the corners. And uh, these drivers throughout the field may disagree with each other on that take. And uh, if they continue to just air everything on the radio, uh, we'll relay it to you. I wish one day you get to the point, Derek, where we can just share that radio with everybody live. But sometimes it, it isn't always the cleanest of radio. Yes, chatter yeah. Either. It's Daytona, it's week one, but, you know, when you get 20-something weeks in and, and you're getting the snot beat out of your back bumper 20 weeks into the year at Martinsville, it get, doesn't get quite as clean. Uh, yeah, it gets a little spicy, doesn't it? It gets a little little rowdy, little ruckus, if you will. Yeah, it can be kind of scary to share them. Uh, unfortunately, it's hard to do. So, right now, look at this. What was once a group of cars I thought was trying to catch this is actually two different groups. I apologize. This is Sam Nieto and the leaders up front with a couple cars there now lapping in the back. This is great news for the cars trying to run them down. As the two and the four, I think it is on us up the two. That's the four, the, the Mountain Dew car in the bottom. They could slow this group up a little bit and really cause a little bit of ha havoc here as far as catching that back group. Yeah, they could, and that's going to be some of the infighting. The other thing is, if you're that super kind of secondary pack, right, the Howe group, 11th on the back, 18-second deficit, at some point, Derek, if you lay back too much, you'll be so far back to the point where they can pit and still stay ahead of you. Now, they're not anywhere close to that yet, right? You're talking about even if you spent one second in the pit box for a splash you're still spending 30 seconds driving down pit road plus the time lost you know slowing down and getting up to speed so you'd have to talk about a 50 second gap to be in that conversation but it is worth noting at some point if you have to slow down so much that you could take yourself all the way out of it again they are nowhere near that number yet but just kind of a, a cautious tale because it would not be the first time I've seen that happen if it happens to present itself a little bit later on. And the second part of that story is then once you get the lead, if you get the lead from this pit cycle that appears to be happening at some point, if you're Dominic Howe in that group is, then when do you start racing? And what does that do to your fuel strategy? Because if you start racing hard amongst each other, you're going to burn extra fuel that you weren't burning while you were slowed down in lane. And, you know, it, these are all factors that have to come into play here with this, you know, burning calculator kind of scenario. So right now, I feel like there's two different sets of opinions here on the track, Evan. There's your group up top who would love for a yellow to come out. They would love to get gas here and not make this a fuel strategy race. Then the bottom of the screen, they're mad I even suggested that word right now. Very different uh, situations for these drivers. They all started at the same point. We knew that fuel strategy was going to become a storyline when they started coming in and topping off on a fuel on lap number three of this race. But it has certainly become the storyline of this Daytona 250. First race of 30 on this 2024 full throttle real sim racing cup series season. And we're happy that you're with us on this Monday night here on Race Spot TV. Derek Watson and myself, Evan Pasoko, our producer Hugo Luis downstairs. Early in this race, when the strategy had yet to bear the forefront of the story, it was all about Andrew Frenosh. He was the man to beat. He led 20 some odd laps early in this one, and then he dropped to the wayside. His group is about to catch these leaders and to give us one big battle for the win. Nieto, though, has led 18 laps, Derek. If he can lead just three more before Freenosh and Co. catch, then he would take over the top spot in terms of fighting for a bonus point and getting the most laps led on the night. Yeah, so that will be, uh, in, in the driver's minds at least, probably a third or fourth storyline for us. It'll be something we'll track and see here, but you're right. And what's going to happen? That's Austin Coop there back here in that Mountain Dew Baja Blast machine. He's starting to fall back off the draft a little bit, and that's good news for Liam Sheen and the others because it only takes about a one-second gap before you start to suck in the draft in the car in front of you. And as Coop loses the draft in the front, he only helps them get the draft in that second group. And it's, you're going to kind of by effect help out those other cars, and, and they're there. Uh, they are very much a part of this battle 
and it is a nine car lead pack here at Daytona. There's some smoke though in three and four. Garrett Pittman in the 42 machine of Tom Morano got together. It was a heavy accident for Pittman, but no caution. This race stays green. Yeah, so the way the RSR works is yeah, we let Irising control the yellows. If Irising does not throw a yellow, it has to be three or more cars involved before the race admins will put the yellow out. Here's Garrett Pittman on the bottom of your screen. And uh, he just got run over him. Like, honestly, we had Matt Denson just barely made it by. That car up top just sort of kept driving down. Where they thought the 77 was going to go. And now the slow damaged 42 machine going to try to squeeze high. Tom Marano's night unfortunately falling apart. It's a beautiful battle beaver Ford, but just not the night that he needed. And he will now drop a lap down. Going to leave us with only 20 cars on the lead lap in this race and that time by it was 25 laps to go three quarters of the way through this daytona season opener this could become the battle for the race win if the pack of cars from 10th on back is unable to save enough fuel to get to the end of this race without a pit stop we know all nine of these cars will need to come down and pit before this race is done it's simply going to be a splash Derek. i don't know what the move is here it kind of goes back to the tandem style super speedway the conversation was always well in the two car tandem who do you want to be off a of turn for you want to be the leader you want to be the car pushing in this context i don't know if i want to be the leader going to the pit stops or not as the 50 car atrepa gets into the outside wall a little bit that'll lose some speed and stunt the momentum of the outside yeah, and the riot has decided he wants to be the leader, by the way, to answer that question you were asking. But you're right. There's a lot of questions to be answered here. If I know if I need a splash of fuel, do I want to wait till the end to do it? Do I want to find a teammate and just go do it now and get it over with? Do I want to be out of the way of whatever calamity could happen? Or do I want to stick with it and just kind of ride out the hopes and dreams of seeing if I can, you know, maybe have a caution that kills that fuel strategy call? Who knows? There's about 100 questions happening right now. And what's, oh, there it is. There's the early pit. That is Sam Nieto with the 24 and others. That's Michael Laraya and everybody. So they have decided to cut this early, Evan. They did. Uh, and Thomas George and company, uh, who do not come down pit road with this group, uh, obviously not a fan of that because they're down to pit road. Uh, Nieto, Laraya, Davis, and Burke down for service. And interestingly, Dylan Coyle and one other driver also get a pit from the back. They were in that group of cars that we were putting in the conversation to be able to make it to the end of the race on a fuel. They obviously felt like they could not. It was Coyle and lapped car Maverick Davis. So Dylan Coyle not going to be able to make it to the end of the race. And what that'll do is give the race lead to Sheen. He is coming down pit road. Oh, look out though, a lot of smoke. Is that a penalty for Sheen and Treppa? Oh, and Treppa misses the box. Black a flag disastrous for pit stop. Yeah, and a black flag on top for speeding. Not one for Liam Sheen that I see on the scoring pylon. But Chris Treppa will get caught for speeding on pit road. Well, they had been so good on a pit road execution tonight, and it is not going to work out. Liam Sheen in and out. He is fine. Thomas George, Daniel Eberhardt will exit together. Where did these cars end up in relation to the other half of their pack that had just pitted? You're going to be looking for uh, Sam Nieto coming up to speed around the outside of turns number one and two. They are only now entering the corner, so I think it's going to be an okay end to all of this for Sheen, for George. Obviously, Treppa, it's disastrous. And now it's a role reversal because the lead will be handed off to Cato, Phillip, and Howe. They have ended up as only three cars. That was once a group of seven to nine. Oh, and a knock at a matter because there's a caution at lap 80. That's going to break a lot of hearts, Evan, to see this yellow come out after strategies just played out. And wow. And you talk about the pressure to maximize everything you can. 
It is going to be a self-spin for Eric Papanow exiting pit road. That causes the caution flag. That is really going to devastate Cato, Phillip, and Howe because everybody else now good on fuel to the end. You almost... I mean, I, I guess you come in anyways, but it's tough because you could stay out, defend your track position, but you're going to cycle to the back, and it is just a tough, tough break that ends that storyline, and this is it. Trying to catch that car in front, right? He needs the draft of that car in front, and it was... I mean, the slightest of touches hmm. to the banking, but when that happens, the car is just going to snap sideways. Well, I'll tell you what, Agno Phillip was up in P2, and we thought that group was good. But Agno Phillip, the moment the other came out, said, oh, thank goodness, I wasn't going to make it. So maybe everyone is happy that this yellow is coming out. Of course, it'll put Kato, Phillip, Howe uh, in the back because they're going to pit here under yellow versus under green, and that'll put the other group ahead. But... If you weren't going to make it, you weren't going to make it. Well, from here on out, Evan, this whole talk is done. Everyone's going on fuel. Everyone's going to have the tires they're going to have. We're done with that conversation. So now we can kind of move on from that stage of the race. As sad as it is, I, I love that. I, I call it the nerdy side of racing, that, that the number crunching and the data and the, the what ifs and all that stuff. But that's over now. Now it's this full throttle racing up until the end of lap 100 or wherever we do finish this race. And now it turns into the fact that this was a Daytona 250 does not matter. Um, those are some mean looking clouds off of turn four, but I don't, I don't think the weather going to be a concern here. Uh, like it next year. most likely will be this weekend in Daytona. Yeah, maybe next year we'll be talking about uh, rain, but here's the decision to pit road. Cato. Phillip, they are down pit road. They're going to be in for service. How is in as well? So it'll put a button on that strategy decision. And then kind of a split call from there. Patterson, Soa, Larson, Maddox is in. Eberhardt uh, also down pit road. He had just been on pit road about three laps ago. Uh, they likely only took a splash to get to the scheduled distance, Derek. So that's why even some of those cars who had pitted recently, Mara, Whitaker, I mean, they were just in. So was Coil. They're going to pit again because now you got to start thinking about how much fuel do you need for overtime. Yeah, that's right. Because I believe here in the Cup Series, it is three attempts at a green-white checker. So you can end up doing an extra, what, 14 laps here or so beyond the scheduled distance if it goes the maximum way it could. So... You do have to think about that here. So that front car, you see, that's not Liam Sheen. That car is waiting for the free pass to send him around. That'll be Liam Sheen and the second car, that green machine, who will lead the field here with, uh, what's going to be, Thomas George, Sam Nieto, Grant Davis, Michael Lariah, Bradley Burke, and Andrew Freenosh on back. This, this field is stacked up front, stacked all the way through the field here. But Liam, of course, as you said, I mean, he's really done it all across iRacing College Series, you know, just worked his way through Road to Pro. You know, RSR has been very successful here. I, I, the difference right now, I would think, between like a Liam Sheen versus maybe, no disrespect, maybe like a Sam Nieto or, you know, a Bradley Burke is the amount of nerves you get. Listen, any, anytime you lead a race at Daytona, you get excited because you want to win at Daytona. But if you're Liam Sheen, You've done it a few more times, Evan. You're not as jittery as you would be if you're a driver doing it for the first time, you know, all nervous about it. So I think Liam's really in the catbird seat here. Well, let's take this chance to talk to our Race Spot TV in race reporter. We have yet to do it so far tonight. So let's drag up Race Spot's own Dylan Coyle. And Dylan, we'll, we'll talk strategy first. We had seen you just recently come down, get the fuel necessary to go the distance, then back down pit road. We're assuming that's because your initial stop was just to get to the end, and now you guys are thinking about overtime. Yeah, what's going on, guys? Um, that was exactly what it was. Just took enough fuel with a... Uh, it's kind of weird, right? You, you got two great chances to to wreck two race cars in the first two races of the season on super speedways and i feel like you know so far it's been pretty good pretty exciting i'm, I'm excited so we'll uh we'll let you strap back in uh, good luck on this restart here and hopefully for your sake we're talking again in a few minutes uh, that would be very very nice thanks guys Three spot zone, Dylan Coyle. He is uh, going to be with us all season long, competing for the full point championship in 2024. 
but of course uh, allowing us to b bother him uh, as these uh, races progress. Pace car off it in. Could it be for the final time tonight at 17 laps to go that we say green flag back in the air for race leader Liam Sheen. Inside pulling the advantage, three car lengths now four as they head to the super stretch. Freenosh looks high, and the 88 car going to go top side and try to lead that charge. Yeah, Liam Sheen did a great job there. Really caught Thomas George sleeping. That inside lane has got a great move, but look at all the movement back here instantly already. The Raya's now up the top, and we're going to possibly put it around here. He was two or three cars deep on the bottom a moment ago, and now he's going to come right here. Sam Mietto's on the bottom. But now we're lined up here neck to neck, nose to nose, as you come around here, complete 84. And already now, Evan, in this game of, of fast moving chess, you're trying to remember who did you right earlier, who did you wrong earlier, who pushed you, who abandoned you. And you want to line up with those people for these last 15 laps or so to see if you can put yourself in a winning position. And in the end, sometimes uh, the best, you know, you, you might have to pick a villain to work with or, or your, you know, whoever dislikes your rival is, is your new best friend. I mean, you're going to have to kind of take what's given to you, too, right? I mean, we talked about the team championship and the massive team alliances that exist behind the scenes. Uh, but in the end, you need to use the cars around you as your means to an end, friend or foe. You gotta make it happen. 15 to go from Daytona. Lap led that time goes to Lariah. Freenosh right there in second. He's led 20. Nieto's led 21. So Nieto, the small advantage in terms of the bonus point for the most laps led. It's a small note, but who knows if that one point could be critical when we're talking about playoff cutoffs later this season. Back to two wide for a minute. Now three wide as the Onana Eberhardt tries to find the middle. Yeah, um, sometimes the three wide is formed by choice, and sometimes it's formed by cars like Eberhardt. Kind of getting stuck in the wrecking. There's a big wreck right Got into Eberhardt, and no yellow yet. Yellow there it is. Caution is out. They had initially gotten away with it as a couple of cars spun to the outside wall, and then it was Mike Maddox who went all the way around, and that was the caution flag at lap number 86, and Kind of what we expected. Three wide breaks out. You're going to have some touches. And uh, Maddox, unfortunately, just turned late in that one after trying to avoid it. And we reset and do it all over again. And it's going to take three or four laps out of the laps remaining in this race. Well, the question you're going to see here for me is watch this is Eberhardt in the middle of that blue and white machine. It's going to get uh, six going to spin down and hit him. Eberhardt's going to keep moving. And here's the second wreck. This is what brings the yellow out right there. That Nieto turned. No, that's not Nieto. Who is that? I can't see a number from that angle. Maddox, but it's Maddox. I, I know the you. orange one is Maddox who got turned around. Yeah, but what I was gonna say for Eberhardt, the question I have now, Evan, is even though he kept racing, what kind of damage was done to the front of that car? What kind of damage is done maybe to the top end speed of that car? Yeah, he's still moving and in theory still in contention back there in P8, but we'll see how hurt that car is from that hard hit. Fourth caution flag of the day. We had two in the opening 10 laps. We then went exactly 70 laps without one and have now had two in the last seven laps. So uh, kind of what you expect out of a Daytona racing and the big story there, the drivers involved. It could have been a lot worse, but George gets damaged. So does the 07, so does the 24. They were the cars that went into the outside wall initially. Um, you can see a slew of cars trickling down to pit road towards the back of the field. Trepa, George, Howe, Papanow, um, Maddox as well, Ross is in. Now's the point in a Daytona race where you start sticking the speed tape on it. You start banging the fenders in and just try to piece together some sort of a car-shaped object to send back out there onto the racetrack. And they you know it is hyperbole. It is a stereotypical phrase, but it still rings true as ever, and it's cautions breed cautions. And I think once we had that one to break up the pitch strategy game, we kind of thought this is what was coming. Yeah, we did, right? We thought that was coming. By the way, you saw that happen at the top of your frame. 
a name we've barely discussed tonight, but a real contender here. Cody Harris just got the free pass. If you saw him go by at the top of your screen, if I were the front of the field and there was a name I didn't want to get a free pass, Cody Harris might be it because uh, he's, he's, he's well-talented, a bit aggressive in a, in a positive way and able to make moves happen. So we'll see if he can get involved in this race here. But I'm going to come back to that topic we talked about under green, Evan. You know, all race long, you're sort of making mental notes. You know, who stuck with you in a draft? Who bumped you too hard? Who didn't bump you? Uh, who was a great bump? You know, who really helped you draft? And now you start to make those notes, and you kind of start looking for people. You don't always get lined up with them, but you get sort of those mental alliances in your head of, of friends and enemies. Brings you back to one of the NASCAR Thunder games. I think it's 2005 that had the friend or foe feature where you could kind of make people mad with, you know, dirty air and all that stuff. And so that's what this may come down to, is who can line up together, what teams can get lined up, and who can dominate this race. See if the lights go out this time by. Cars already on the apron, trying to save some fuel to get to the end of it. Everybody has pitted within the last 10 laps, so should be good to go to the scheduled distance in this one and the lights do go out on top of the pace car we will come around to take 11 laps to go the next time by and try it all over again you talk about some of the new looks how about the 44 machine of michael lariah long-term partnership with him and sim speed shop but it's a new look on the 44 tonight new look for Bradley Burke, new look for Agno Phillip. Uh, Andrew Freenosh goes from primer gray to primer black. So everyone's mixing stuff up. Liam Sheen might have, I think, maybe my favorite new paint scheme of the year in the Apex Racing Toyota. I, I'm always a fan of the, I, I don't know if it's, you know, dirt late models, the way to describe it, but that kind of paint scheme with the sharp edges and geometrical mm -hmm. shapes is, is kind of popular in that scene. And you've seen a lot of the artists, uh, Blackbeard and some others, bringing it to some of the cup ranks on some of the teams that they work with. But that's always been a style I've enjoyed, and that one might be one of my favorites. By the way, an easy one, by the way. Thank you out there. If we can go back to the 82 car real quick, can we talk about Minazzi Major? This is maybe the easiest reskin for you and I. It's still the Sprite car. We just took the cranberry off. That is possibly the easiest repaint you and I could spot all night long. And you talk about brand awareness and consistency. There will be many cars, people who have been in this series for years. When I see the car on track, guess what I'm going to do, Derek? I'm going to look at the leaderboard just to make sure I know who I'm talking about. I could spot that Sprite car from a mile oh, yeah. away. Oh, yeah. So it's good when you have some drivers who have got some consistent looks. Grant Davis has always got the flames. Dylan Coyle's always rocking his same color palette. Uh, I'm familiar with that Sirius XM number six car back there, a Thomas George as well. And uh, fun to see these drivers kind of develop those personas and those identities here in this full throttle Real Sim Racing Cup Series. Pace car going to be off and in again this time. Front row sees Bradley Burke and Michael Lariah to the Geico restart zone. They go green flag back in the air with 11 laps to go in Daytona. And once again, that the, that inside lane got the jump on the outside lane. Lariah, that's just a hard thing to do is start from the outside. But Lariah's got it caught up pretty quickly, which is not as big of a jump as they got on Thomas George last time by. It's not as big of a jump, you're right, and therefore the outside line is right there, lockstep with them. They'll get the speed advantage down the super stretch, and they'll pull a nose advantage off to turn three. So it is now Loriah just in front of the 95 car. Two lanes for now, but a three wide, a couple of rows back as the 24 of Davis tries to make the middle happen. By the way, what a great bit of discipline by Sam Nieto right there. He knows Freenosh is all over the back end of Michael Lariah. And as much as Nieto wants to get up there and, and really help, he knows that pushing the pusher is the biggest no-no of all the super speedways. So Nieto has to be patient. Oh, well, that move on the bottom was great. But Nieto doing a great job at helping, but staying back out of the way. 
Back down to two wide. The middle didn't work for the 24. Ooh. Now what a move to the outside for Agnel Phillip. Not Goes clear. Low to top side, makes it clear, and finds himself leaning up top now, forcing his way through. Everhart again going to go middle 3-1. The 09's been the instigator tonight as now the 44 car slices high to low and a bit of payback there, and that strategy is on the inside line trying to go for the race lead is that 44 car a Michael Araya. Yeah, doing a great job and wrecking in the back again. Oh, that's a car around. And we are going to be yellow now again on lap 92. And we're now going to have at least one more shot of this here at Daytona. Maddox involved, George involved, caution flag number five of the afternoon. And uh, some frustration. Six car felt like he got hooked. Re that one right underneath the, the scoring tower. I would, I'd say that's probably a pretty fair synopsis. Let's see. He's up top and hard to tell. Is it, you know, is the 50 trying to get behind him and push? Is he just pushing up a little bit? But certainly got up into the left rear of the six. Yeah, I definitely got up into him and really just you know unfortunate. Sometimes in these moments you have to guess, but when you're clear, if you wait too long to move up, you'll lose bits of that draft and. You know, that's why spotters are important, whether it be the simulated spotters or whether it be real life spotter. You have to listen to them and, and wait to see what happens here because they will dictate everything about this. Well, here we go, Evan. We're going to start with about, what, five to go, maybe, and really be on the move here. So we'll see probably any hints of politeness, patience, uh, calmness. That's over. Right. In fact, you could kind of see it in that last run before the yellow came out. I noticed that Liam Sheen was beating the back bumper of Bradley Burke all through that corner right before that yellow came out. So Liam Sheen's already there, and we're not even five to go yet. Yeah, we're not even at that point yet, and this is going to push us to maybe four to go for the restart, maybe even five, depending on how quick the cleanup can happen. Um, that's why I brought up the point when the last jail happened is, it, is that takes, you know, four or five laps out of the race. So if you're 15th, seven laps to go sounds a whole lot better than four. And every yellow, essentially now almost in overtime to this point, right? But however many laps we have green in regulation coming up next is going to be a sprint. It makes it that much harder on those cars to make moves. So they're going to be more desperate. It's going to be more aggressive. And... They didn't want these yellows because they needed these laps under green to make the headway that they have to make up. Yeah, that's sort of why the aggression ramps up is because now you feel like you have limited time and limited availability on the moves you can make. And so you have to be more aggressive in those moves here. But all right, well, this will definitely, I think, be our last restart under the scheduled distance, Evan. So now that conversation you had about, what, 20 laps ago is relevant of, you know, who pitted for gas who pitted for the extra green white checker gas i would think with all the caution laps so that's got to be almost a non-topic at this point but who knows what could still come of this and all these drivers have an opportunity to to kind of stop and and think um you know try to strategize in a perfect world who am i going with where am i going who am I drafted with? Am I picking the top? Am I picking the bottom? Um, now is the time to make those decisions. And then ironically enough, the second we get the green flag, none of that's going to happen. It all falls apart and you're on your own, as is super speedway racing. So because it's so impossible, why not put you on the spot, Derek? We got probably lights out next time by, green with five to go. Um, I'll give you a two-parter, and I will also answer the questions so you're not on your own. Uh, overtime, yes or no? Yes. And I will also say yes, so we'll take yes. that one. Um, and then who's your pick for the win, which is a bit of a harder open-ended one? <laughs> um, somebody with four wheels. No, um, I liked how aggressive he was being before the other came out. I really believe in Liam Sheen, currently riding P5. I, I think Liam will find a way to win this race. I don't dislike the call. I'm scanning through. Um, God, storyline-wise, I'd love to say Daniel Eberhard just because it is return to RSR, being the instigator, wearing the black hat, that 
it, it would be quite the story. Um, but Agno Phillips has been driving like a man possessed. Uh, Agno's normally, you know, known for finding victory lane and finding success by just being that much better than everybody else and not having to overwork for it. He's driving like he really, really wants this one. So although it sounds like a layup because it's from the front row, I think it's a bold pick to go with Agno Phillip. Well, the question will be, is Agna Phillip more successful than our past two outside leaders as far as jumping the start? If Leroy gets that big jump on Agna Phillip, he'll have a long way to go to maybe catch this field here. But he has a great pusher in Freenosh behind him. That's what let the last restart not go so bad. Freenosh was all over the top lane, just pushing and pushing and pushing. Uh, now, if I'm going to put you one more, Evan, if you had to do a dark horse, someone outside the top 10 currently, I would put a little bit of hope in... I'm going to go deep in the field and see. I think if, if we had to go outside the top 10, I'd like to see Cody Harris bring this back around. That's a deep, deep cut. Yeah, that is, because he is dead last 23rd, and not only that, but he'll be lining up behind lapped cars, having got the wave by. Um, I'm not going to go quite as bold, um, but I think Grant Davis could very much win this race from P12. Um, I think he does have the disadvantage of starting up top, but he's somebody who has had success. And he's right, you know, just one spot ahead of Dylan Coyle. So if I'm saying Grant could do it, could Dylan do it? A couple of the drivers to watch. The benefit is all you got to do to be in contention for the win is to be on the racetrack and have four tires underneath you. And even sometimes that's optional on a late restart at Daytona because it is about to get wild. Buckle up tight. Going to be five laps to go in the Daytona season opener of the 2024 Full Throttle Real Sim Racing Cup Series. Loraya takes the green flag. We're back underway. Ah, oh, man. Freenosh is not on the back of Agno Phillip, who did get jumped a little bit here. So, oh, there's a jump up. That is Liam Sheen, and they're wrecking in the back. That's the 77 others, and they're, well, oh, we're one for one so far. One for one, because that does mean we are going to be headed to overtime. This yellow is going to push us into the uh, overtime period. We're going to go beyond schedule distance. We'll wind this back and see what happens. Oh, hooked on the right rear. I think that was the 50 car of Trepa trying to go to the middle. And is Trepa involved in, what's it, the second yellow in a row, I think. So having a hard time there. Well, Agno Phillip got a slow start and got past here by Liam Sheen on the outside. We'll wait and make sure that's how the scoring pylons are going to count it when the yellow came out. But that appears to be the case here. So now we're into our first bit of RSR overtime, Evan. It is going to be the first trip uh, to RSR overtime of the year. And I don't think uh, anybody is surprised that it happens in the Daytona season opener. Um, it'll be three attempts at a green-white checker overtime finish. Um, if we get to that third attempt and cannot take the white flag, then the race will be done at the moment of yellow. On any of these attempts, if you get to the white flag, uh, the race is official no matter what happens in terms of race cars and being able to make it to the end of the race. That is uh, free-for-all at that point on to the end. And... Uh, the sim not yet officially saying overtime, but uh, the lights would have to go out this time by. Don't see that happening. No, I don't see that happening either. Not that I can think of. There's still there was still a free pass car to get around and other things to happen. So, yep, I think we're going to go around again. I do want to bring it up. I think everyone's safe, but it is worth bringing up here that there are some drivers who didn't pit a while ago to kind of secure that green white checkered fuel. Uh, it's just hard to imagine that with all the yellow flags we've had, that everyone's not super, super safe here. But uh, it is worth saying, just to be obvious, now that the lights are off because they're now double filing up here. Nope, the lights are still on. I see them there. I'm sorry. I They're just double filing up just to trick me, Evan. They're, they're just ready to go. They want to get into it. Uh, wave around that time and rejoining or getting a lap back is going to be Dominic Cow. He'll go from six down to five. So nothing groundbreaking there. And um, unfortunately, uh, it's going to kind of be a little bit too late. Chris Trevor also claimed responsibility for the accident. He will get an end of the longest line to penalty. Yeah, and as you said earlier, and we're explaining the rules that the benefit to that is less of a penalty 
for Chris just to claim it and call it his and know that it was on him. Uh, that end of the longest line, though, that's so, so painful as a driver to have to sit through right now and let it happen to you because he'll be well back on the inside lane here when this restart happens. Well, here we are. Let's run through your top five now. It's going to be Lariah, Burke, Liam Sheen in third, Agno Phillip in fourth, Cam Patterson up in fifth. So not much has changed. Maybe some, a couple names are different, but it feels like at least for Lariah and um, for Agno Phillip, both up there, but Agno really fell back. Yeah, Agnel slips uh, backwards in all of this. He'll be fourth outside of row two. Again, to your point, that was simply the disadvantage of being the lead car on the outside is the inside gets the better jump right out of the gate, and then the yellow came up before they could build momentum back up. Yeah, and that, that really is. We talk about it a lot, Evan. That's the hardest thing to do in iRacing is starting from the outside. It's just hard to see the car on the inside, especially when that car gets to control to start in leagues like RSR where the leader is your control car. You know, it's so difficult in Irishman because you can't jump him. You can't get out ahead of him. You can't go before he goes. But you're trying to also make sure you go when he goes. And it is incredibly difficult, no matter the monitor setup. This is not a, 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 a diff, uh, conversation about singles or triples or VR, like some other factors to Irishman. It's just difficult. Even in triples, it's hard to keep your eyes to the left and spot that car and go with him. Well, it is going to officially extend this race for RSR overtime. It is attempt number one of a possible three. Remember, if we get a caution flag before the white flag flies, we will slow down, reset, and we'll push ourselves to attempt number two. If you get to the white flag, it does not matter what happens from that point on. You are going to race back to the start finish line with a race win and a potential locked in spot into the playoffs in 2024 on the line. We've already handed out some bonus points here and there. Some midway stage break points have been handed out as well. Nothing beats race points. 40 to the race leader, to the race winner. And of course, that golden ticket to the postseason is what Lariah, who leads the inside row, wants. It's what the 95 up on the outside of the racetrack wants as well. If you're Bradley Burke, and it's what every guy chomping on their heels behind them is willing to do anything to take away. Yeah, there's a lot of people who will do a lot of things to win at Daytona, whether it may be wreck a friend, wreck a family member, you know, you'll do almost anything to win at Daytona. So the, the intensity will only get a little bit thicker here as you're going out. It's Liam Sheens. Oh, no, sorry. No, it's Bradley Burke's turn, pardon me, to see if he can make something happen on the outside. If he can do a better jump than the previous two or three attempts. Here we go. It is attempt number one of three at RSR Overtime in this Daytona season opener. Pace car down and in. Field in the hands of the 44 of Michael Lariah. Green flag back in the air. Can we make it all the way around for this race to be official? Slow gear shift for the 44 car. And here comes Burke topside. He's got the advantage to turn one. We have folks on the lap. That's the best outside jump so far. Burke, though, getting sort of in that danger zone of riding that middle uh, through that the turn part of me. You start riding like that, people are going to pass you inside and outside. He has to make a lane here, which now apparently appears to be the middle and now down to the bottom. Three wide through the middle comes Patterson. Phillip leads the outside. Burke leads the inside. Oh, it's all going to fall apart. Patterson gets turned. There is the big one at Daytona. Wow, that's going to be massive. This is going to be literally a who's who of competitors in that wreck and a lot of people now trying to scramble to keep cars running enough to score points here. But look at that. That's all that's left. Right about there in that camera shot. That's who made it. That's who survived. You knew the three wide was coming. They flirted with it at times tonight, and almost any time they did so, it ended in tears. Eberhardt to the garage. There goes my pick for the win. He got slammed into the outside wall. Freenosh got spun. Major was in it. 
48 car, 28 car, 53, 24, 25. It's about a dozen cars. And let's take a second look. Watch the inside lane here with the 10. And it's going to be, uh, I don't know what if he just, wow. I was watching the bottoms. There was a couple of bumps happening on the bottom with Lariah, but that's not it. That middle car just sort of snapped around it, looked like Evan. And then things just sort of went bananas from there. It's a tough one. And, and we had seen some decently sized accidents over the course of this race. You know, six cars, seven cars. But that is by far the biggest. And uh, it comes as no surprise that you get the big wrecks late in these races this is what you expect at a super speedway race and it's why so many drivers hate it here's the onboard perspective with nicholas mara let's watch this here he's gonna be right in the middle of three wide and see the top lane's probably open you can't see up top of him here wrecks happening and right on through twice <laughs> oh buy a lottery ticket nicholas mara because you just hit the jackpot he is able to sneak on through. He will be P6 when we get ready for the restart. Philip leads his hope survive. Burke, Lariah, Sheen, Nieto going to be the cars behind inside of the top five. And now there's so many drivers frantically trying to get the maximum required of or i guess you know the minimum required repairs to allow those cars to get back out on track or if they're not being mandated to be on pit road get the maximum amount of damage you can get fixed on the car and then just get it back out there yeah because points matter here as you've said all night long this is the whole season this isn't a one-off race so those points could matter later by the way if i want to dig back in the field for a second we'll point him out not there yet but the 28 car cody harris has survived both these wrecks Remember you said he was P22? He's P13, Evan. So great job for Cody Harris. Not quite there yet. Let's watch this one more time. This is from Cody's viewpoint, by the way. Let's see how he makes it through. He's going to go up to the top here. Rex happening. Rex happening. Oh. oh almost had it. Didn't and make got it hit from oh. behind. But a great save there, all things considered. Yeah. And really, I mean, yeah, there's damage there. But compared to everything behind him, you see in his mirror. That, that, you're, you're okay. It certainly could have been a lot worse, um, especially yeah. with how violent that hit seemed to be. It looked like when he turned down to try to avoid the wreck, he got turned and then got hit again. You can see, though, any time there's a wreck, where do they all go? Everybody tries to go low, right? Those cars are kind of naturally going to slide up high. I always got really claustrophobic when I was on the outside line at a plate race because... Well, there's a wall next to me, there's a car behind me, there's a car inside of me, and a car in front of me. Yeah, there's nowhere to go. At least on the bottom, you have a false sense of escape. In this case, that inside line did help. Now, there is zero chance when you're coming to the white flag that you're thinking, oh, well, let me stay on the bottom in case there's a wreck, right? At that point, all bets are off. But as a general rule, I've always felt a little bit safer on the bottom, and I think more cars that were on the bottom were able to find an opening. Yeah, that is, as you said, that false sense of security narrative that drivers have or like to think where from hugging the bottom, I could swing it way left, you know, and I could avoid a wreck. But especially on the back straight, the cars go everywhere when a wreck happens. There's, there's no, like, rhyme or reason. You could drive that car all the way down to the bus stop on the back straight. Or, you know, are we allowed to call it the bus stop? I, I refuse. I'm yelling at clouds again here. Um, you know, and still find a car down there. So... All right, well, now we got a new leader, by the way. Agnel Phillip was in the lead at the moment of caution. So now he gets to control the field for the first time. Michael Oraya is the pusher. And does Agnel like the fact that by the leader, he will be on the inside of the front row? Um, he is going to drop down there to the bottom. Bradley Burke, therefore, going to slide up to the outside in the number two spot. Sheen and Loria row two. Mara Nieto, row three. Kato, Soa, row four, Coop, and Mara, row number 10. Still 19 total cars on the lead lap in this one. They've all got at least a shot at it of the 34 who started this race. It's going to be attempt number two of three at RSR Overtime here in Daytona. 
Agno Phillip decides the start of the race once he reaches the blue paint to the Geico restart zone. Pace car off and in, coming to two laps to go in the Daytona season opener. Green flag back in the air. Nice jump there, but what he did, oh man, he got up there. So I say what he did is he almost cut himself away from the draft. Sort of did the old lame duck, but now Berg is now to the inside. So they're going to swap lanes here, Evan, and Berg's going to try to lean the inside and will with a push, a hard push from Michael Lariah. It is a big push. Lariah aggressively on the bottom. That 78 Liam Sheen just as aggressive topside. The bottom's got a few more cars lined up for the moment. Still nobody going to the middle three wide. They need to get to the start finish line for this race to be official. Now the top side pulls the advantage in turn three. Yeah, the bottom lane is just a little off center. Look at the, the gap there between the three. That's how they're all off center. That's killing that draft. And Agatha Phillips is going to bring us onto the white flag. And from here, all bets are off, Evan. We're going around one more time. One more trip around, white flag in the air. This race is official. Burke struggling, he falls back. Big block to the inside. Sheen trying to get it all to a wreck in. Morris spins. The 95 of Burks into the outside wall, but the white flag flies and it's a drag race as Agno Phillip is pushed by Liam Sheen. Now the question for Liam Sheen, two questions. One, can, Neo get a, can Nieto pardon me, get up there and help him? And two, when is Sheen going to make that move? You know he's not going to sit behind here and just push Philip to the win. When is it too late to make the move here? Watch out of four for him to come down with Nieto, see if they can double team here. Here comes Nieto in third, looking low. The 78 car tries to get low. He can't do it. Oh, there's going to be contact. Philip slides. Philip saves it. And Agno Philip wins the Daytona season opener. Wow, what... Wow, all the way through to the end of the race, there's contacts and spins and wrecks. But Agna Phillips survives and pushes himself closer to one more title. They made those moves in reverse order. The two car Nieto was in third. He went low before Sheen tried to go low to get under Agnel. And when that happened, they all cut each other off, right? Watch the two car undercut the 70. When he does that, now Sheen can't go down. So when Sheen tries to come down, he's already there. Philip gets a bit of a touch. It is a big wreck for Liam Sheen, who will still finish third in this race. And Agno Philip, to your point, it is the defending Cup Series champion from the last two seasons who is taking his first step to a three-peat Agno Philip winner at Daytona. Here's his view. Yeah, I think this is just him turning laps afterwards. We'll see. Well, here it is. You're right. This is going to be the view. What a nice job of wheeling it there to keep it you know, rocking back and forth. And now celebrates it on the front straightaway. Agno Phillip is back at a familiar spot. He's an RSR Cup Series winner on a Monday night, and he has thrown the gauntlet for those who are trying to come after his title belt because the defending champ is back in victory lane. And maybe just as quickly as the season started, maybe back into the playoffs already. I think the celebration is going to continue for quite some time. So let's take a look at your RSR race results. Had to go 105 laps to get this one figured out. But in the end, it is the A51 Pro X Altus of Dante 4 who takes home the race win. Sam Nieto does steal P2 from Sheen in the end. Sheen settles for third. We'll try to get a word with all of those drivers in just a few moments. Ross Cato and Andrew Freenosh finish inside of the top five. It's a P6 for Austin Coop, Nick Mara, P7. Bonazzi Major, Thomas George, and Bradley Burke, your top ten. Rounding it back here into P11, you're going to find Matthew Morrow with Grant Davis behind him. Michael Araya finishes P13. Cody Harrison, P14. Eric Papenow is 15th. And then Steve Soa, Brett Larson, Braden Winokur, Tom Morano, and Chris Treppa round out your top 20. DeAndre Kane, Cam Patterson, Dominic Howe, Daniel Everhart, and Dylan Coyle finish inside of the top 25 with Brandon Gass, Garrett Pittman, Maverick Davis, Mike Maddox, and Matt Danson. Your top 30. A lot of names there who led laps tonight that were not, in the end, able to fight for the win. A lot of heartbreak there. James Ross in 31st. Kevin King talked about him retiring early back in 32nd with Joseph Dice. And then Brandon Westbrook, the earliest to retire with Chris Tep Trepa, pardon me, your lap fastest lap on lap 74. 
And that is a look top to bottom at your RSR full race results and burning through that so quickly. The drivers have yet to unbuckle and meet us on pit road. So you get a little bit more of our analysis while we wait on some of the drivers to join us there. Um, it is worth noting that, you know, Agano Phillip is not necessarily guaranteed a spot in the playoffs. There is a chance that with a 20 race regular season, you could, in theory, have more than 16 different race winners. But it is almost certain that that's not going to happen and the diagonal is going to be there no matter what. And speaking of which, let's go down trackside with the driver of the number 94 machine. Agno Phillip is your race winner tonight at the Daytona International Speedway. Agno, congratulations on a win. All is right on a Monday night because you're back in Cup Series victory lane. Thanks, Evan. That was that was super fun. Um, been really wanting to win one of these for uh, for a while now, Every ever since I kind of came into the league. Um, just always seem to get kind of into wrecks at the end of the, the first races here. It's our, it's our Daytona 500, I guess, but, um, yeah, no, that was fun. That was really fun. Great way to, to kick off the, the season. Uh, glad I don't even have to worry about the playoffs now for the, for the rest of the season. That's nice. Just as quickly as the season started, the quest for a three-peat takes that next step, and you're already being able to yeah. think about playoffs. This race, though, was interesting, right? I mean, you get the yellow late, it's going to turn into a bit of a Wild West like Daytona always does. But for a majority of this race, fuel strategy was the name of the game. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was, you know, we were just riding around there trying to make the fuel work. I did not manage that section at all well you know i was kind of hoping they would catch us at the end and i could save a little bit to make it um because I, I was i was pretty short and then the caution came out and you know became a true daytona race at that point um i don't i i've been on the right side of the fuel strategy thing at these super speedway races a few times and it never seems to end up really mattering because then you have the caution and just goes to chaos but it was fun there at the end you know coming up through the field too that's that's why we love this this style of racing so it was good having tried out a different vehicle with the winter series and now back in something that's i don't know if more stable is is the right way to put it but more familiar in these nascar next gen cup series cars um obviously the win has to help but what's the confidence level what do you guys look to accomplish racing for another full campaign here as the two-time defending champ yeah, I mean, we'll just try to go out and have some fun for for the season, you know. Um, I think I, I always enjoy running these these leagues on on Monday nights. Um, it's just a nice nice little uh, little tune up, especially now that the the races are the the week before the official series go there for for kind of NIS, and it's it's always fun racing with those guys, you know, like Michael and and Bradley and Liam and Sam up at the front. You know, those, they're always uh, really good to race around. So. Uh, it's just it's good competition and and it's a good place to kind of try some things out try to sharpen some skills you know obviously the um we, we're we got a lot of attention focused on making another run at the pro series here but um you know we'll just try to have some fun and and try to you know obviously once the playoffs start we'll we'll really try to lock in and and go for that three-peat as you said but you know just try to get better i mean that's the that's what we do try to do every time we get out here so We'll let you get out of here and uh, get to celebrating. But before we do, as always, Agnel, who makes it happen for you? I know it is a familiar group, but it's a new look on that number 94 car. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, got to shout out uh, Matt Danson, fellow competitor here who uh, had some uh, internet troubles uh, today. But uh, yeah, he made this new scheme. I think it looks great. Uh, really excited to, to race that all year. Um, got to thank the guys over at 851 Pro and, and Lockdown Racing for their support um, in Road to Pro. Um, and, uh, you know, gotta, gotta give a shout out to my colleagues with the ProPublica Guild, still, still working on that first contract, but we, you know, in the meantime, we got great, great stuff for you to check out over at ProPublica.org, um, great investigations. So please, please do check that out. And finally, I, this actually was a, uh, somewhat special race for me in some ways, I guess, uh, streamed for the first time. Uh, so go follow me on Twitch at, uh, Agnel underscore Phillip. Uh, if you if you want to catch these, I'll try to stream these every every week. Uh, big thanks to my partner for helping me set that up, and the other guys who kind of were were there for for the week. But yeah, um, or for the race. So yeah, I guess that's it. And thanks thanks to you, Evan, for putting these on again and dealing with all the uh, complaints and comments from everybody uh, in the in the various discords. I'm, I know it's a thankless job, but we appreciate you putting it on.
I appreciate you yeah, being a part of this. That is uh, race winner, defending champion, and now streamer, Agno Philip Agno. Uh, thanks for chatting. Congrats on the win, and uh, we'll catch you soon, I'm sure. Thanks, Evan. Appreciate it. So Agna Phillip ends the season in victory lane. He finished the season last year with a P2 at Phoenix that secured him the championship, and he is right back on track. The three-peat gets a little bit closer. Agna Phillip's starting to think about playoffs. Well, at the start finish line in this one, Sam Nieto comes home in P2. He was the third car chasing down the leaders. Derek coming into turns three and four. You're with the driver of the two. Yeah, Sam, what a great run there on the last lap for the two car. Walk me through the last lap. The big wreck happens, and then what's going through your head? I'm thankful to be alive. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> this, I don't. I don't live through many of these. I think all my time in this league, four or five years, I've finished one plate track. Um, honestly, I have no idea what happened. Uh, I was pushing. I had my car as far as up uh, up Lorai as it could go, and they started wrecking. I don't know if. I pushed too hard. If someone else pushed too hard, I think somebody said there was some net code between somebody and somebody else. But yeah, I was just pushing for all I had, and luckily I got through. <clears throat> excuse me, got through the wreck there and didn't really lose much momentum. And I was talking to Liam a little bit there, I told him I felt like I had an eternity to think about playing my move as I was catching him because I knew I was going to catch him. Just that's just how the draft's insane. Um, just sucking right up to him, and uh, I got to him before I wanted to. And, um, you know, I went down to make a move at the bottom, um, hoping Liam would side draft uh, Agnell and I'd squirt through. But I think uh, Liam wanted to stay in front of me, obviously, so I could push him. And I think he just missed it by a little bit. And we got together and then I, wa I watched him die in my rear view. Yeah, it's always hard to see a competitor when you, when you see that wreck happen. But listen, you told me before the race, it's like no place like home. I think it's a quote you said, or you felt like you were coming home might've been the quote when you're talking about coming back to the next gen cars after racing the gen fours and the icebreaker series. Well, you've, uh, you've, you've, you've made a home for yourself here. P two in the first night. This is pretty, uh, pretty awesome finish. Yeah, I'm pleased with it. Like I said, I'm just thankful to be alive. I think if I would have finished 15th, I still would have been pleased. I'm tickled to death probably, but yeah, P2 is just icing on the cake. Um, I think if Agnell would have had 1% less talent, he wouldn't have uh, saved that car and I would have won, but <laughs> Agnell being Agnell, he's got to win. Well, listen, Sam, great job tonight. I know we talk every week and I always say good luck and we say maybe we'll talk in the podium interview room. Well, we got to do it, so good job tonight. All right, thanks, guys. Appreciate it. You're welcome. We got Sam Nieto finishing P2 here tonight, Evan. I think it's time to talk with the driver who finished P3 and get a different perspective with Liam Sheen. Let's see, Liam. Well, P3 on your first night in, what was your perspective of the final lap? Um, yeah, I saw the inside with a big run. I was yelling at Agnel on the, on the driver chat to drop down because um, if we just stayed high, uh, the entire field was going to blow by us, so... I was trying to yell at him to get down. I got down, and I guess Nick behind me checked up, and everyone kind of just ran into one another behind. But, um, you know, saw the big wreck. I saw Sam peek through, so I was thinking, man, you know, engine's getting pretty hot. Um, and then uh, into three and four, it was still running way too hot to really, like, give him a good shove because, you know, I had to tandem him the entire first lap around. Um, to make the outside line work, but um, yeah, into into three out of four or whatever, I saw Sam there. So my only move was to just wait until he ducked out and then tried to block that so I can get the shove from him, and hopefully uh, that would be enough to come into the line. But I just timed it too early and uh, hooked myself. So nothing Sam did there. Um, I enjoyed racing up front the entire time. Well, you sort of answered my next question, but I'm going to ask it in a different way. What was the last possible moment you had planned in your head to move down? It, it, for example, if it had just been you and Agnel up front, were you devoted to Agnel or were you eventually going to pull it out at some point? Well, there was no one that was going to be able to pass us. So, I mean, I was going to race him out for it the entire last lap. I mean, whichever one of us, you know, bobbed ahead coming to the line, you know, would be the winner. But um, Sam was there, so I had no choice but to push him. <clears throat> Fair enough. Well, great job tonight, P. Three. I'll give me a second to promote yourself here. Who makes it happen for you? What are your plans for the year? What do you got going on? Uh, plans for the year. Um, 
we're going to sit out of road to pro this year. Uh, it's, it's made me quite the toxic person. So, um, uh, you know, I've been kind of a, a rude guy to some people like Matt Danson. I've been kind of a prick to him. So I'm going to sit out road to pro, uh, just run this, have a fun time with these guys. They seem to have fun all year. So, um, Around September, I might have to back out uh, because I'm switching schools, so I don't know if I'll be able to bring my swim stuff. But um, as far as people that make it happen, uh, pff, the guys at Nexus, uh, we got two guys in Coke. Uh, I'm going to be on the box tomorrow for uh, Kwame Scott, so cheer him on. Um, and then uh, Apex Racing Academy, uh, VRS, all that side of things. Um, all those guys over there that make things happen for us um, help us keep speed in our cars. So um beyond that uh, i'd like to thank you guys for broadcasting i look forward to having a fun season here well we look forward to seeing you next week at atlanta liam have a good night thanks you too all right evan that's liam sheen finished third in the 78 machine and just like that one race down 29 still to go we start that march towards the full throttle cup championship a championship belt and so much more on the line at the end and it's funny because we always start these seasons at daytona it's a familiar feeling and while it is the official kickoff and these points are very important right points here at daytona are just as critical as they are in that last week at Darlington, a lot of people can tend to dismiss Daytona as, oh, I got in a wreck, it's Daytona, it is what it is, right? There's four plate races this season, three of them are in the regular season. Uh, these points matter. This win by Agatha matters. The pole, the P3 by Liam Sheen, all of that matters just as much now as it will when we're talking about a playoff push in the middle of the summer. Yeah, points are points and even wins are wins. I mean, like I said, you know, uh, Agnell thinks he's safe for the playoff contention. So yeah, you want to get every point to matter here. So great job tonight. I had fun tonight, Evan. You're sort of camped out here all week long, uh, but I get to kind of call it a night here and, and take my stuff home. It is going to be a long week here at Daytona, right? I mentioned the Coke Series is here. Official iRacing is here. The iRacing Daytona 500. And then hopefully, weather permitting, I'll head out to Daytona International Speedway this weekend. So it should be a fun time. And then we look forward to when we do meet up and do this again next Monday. And it's almost Derek a bit of the same right historically Atlanta has not been a place compared to Daytona but ever since the rescan we're going to be throwing out those words draft pack big one probably just as much as we did tonight yeah just as much maybe the word we'll use is breaks we might use the word breaks next week but that'll be the only difference and we look forward to, to having you with us then and every race as we continue this 2024 season. But until next time, that is it for us here tonight from Daytona. On behalf of our entire team at Real Sim Racing, Race Spot TV, and for your broadcast crew tonight. For our producer, Hugo Louise, for Derek Watson, and myself, Evan Pasoko, I want to thank you for tuning in and congratulate your defending champ, Agno Phillip, on race win number one of 2024. We're back next week. That is Monday, February. February the 19th from iRacing's virtual Atlanta Motor Speedway. That race and every race of the 2024 Full Throttle Real Sim Racing Cup Series can be found exclusively right here on Race Spot TV. Till next time, good night from Daytona.